Okay, thank you for being here. We're gonna go ahead and get started. I want to welcome all of you to our Parkinson Education Program this afternoon. We had a terrific response to, I told Joel he had to wear his bunny slippers and his jammies, but there you are. And I know that several of you, like myself, have been groupies and coming to these year after year to hear what, what's new. And we really asked Dr. Perlmutter this year to focus on your questions because there's a lot going on in the field and it's very, very exciting. And those of you who had an opportunity to hear Dr. Perlmutter at our fashion show have been calling. And so we asked if he would just answer questions today. So I think by answering, we've already had about 100 questions. So not only that, but if you have questions that develop and you hold them up, we will come collect your cards and continue with the uh, questions then. So for those of you who don't know Dr. Perlmutter, I want to give you just a little introduction. He is head of the movement disorder section at Washington University School of Medicine. He is the Elliot Stein Family Professor of Neurology. He's the director of the American Parkinson Disease Association Advanced Research Center for Parkinson Disease, which is one of eight centers around the country, and it's one that our chapter actually provides a $100,000 grant to through your donations for his research. He's also director of the Huntington Disease Center of Excellence at Washington University. He teaches not only in the neurology department, but also he's a professor of radiology, a professor in occupational therapy, a professor in physical therapy, and he has enough accolades that I could spend the next several hours telling you all of them. But those of you who know him, who've heard him speak, know he's a wonderful speaker and he's full of unbelievable knowledge, so um, I'm going to turn it over to him in just one moment. We, we actually get two for one today, so that's even, even nicer. But before we do that, I want to make sure that you picked up. There was a walk-run flyer, so for those of you who maybe are not walk-runners yourself, but you may have family who is. We have lots of grandchildren children that want to participate and children, so if you want to pick one of those up, they'll be on the table in the back. You should all by now have received your November link newsletter. So if you don't regularly receive these, and you should receive them quarterly, so the next, uh, they come out in November, February, May, and August. So if you haven't received this on a regular basis, be sure and sign up at the tables outside. And then we have a new weekly exercise class uh, that started a while back with Trisha Creel at 1.30 on Mondays at the center. So. We're going to be adding a day to that. It's been so very popular, so please come and join us for that. You don't have to sign up. You just have to wear comfortable clothes and, and attend, and you'll be delighted to be participating in that. <laughs> we also have some um, information on the memory study that we'll put out at the resource table as well. And then I'm sure Dr. Perlmutter will let everybody know uh, how you can get involved in clinical trials, because I know that's very important to many of us here. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to you. Well, thank you very much, Debbie. Is this on, or do I? Just okay. So can you hear me in the back now? Okay. So thank you very much, Debbie, for that wonderful introduction. And when I was told I had to come up here and answer questions and had already 100 questions ahead of time, I went to Canada and enlisted my uh, colleague, Dr. Wayne Martin, who's uh, been a professor of neurology and, and uh, a movement disorder specialist at University of Alberta in Edmonton, and he's actually doing a research project with us for the couple of weeks, and since he's staying at my house, I thought he had to work for it. <laughs> so he's going to sit over here, and any question that's too difficult for me, I will pass to him, and we can get uh, different opinions, because you know, if there are two doctors here, you can get at least three opinions for your answers. <laughs> All right, so we have a lot of questions that were sent in. I tried to group them a little bit uh, in, into some kind of organizational structure. And uh, this is really weird. You know, I usually give a talk and show slides that people kind of know what they are. And I always have an opportunity to show pictures of some of my friends or at least part of my rock collection. And uh, so here I'll go ahead and start with this. So the first question is, is there any sort of general progression of Parkinson's disease? even though we know it affects everyone differently, and are there plateaus? Does it seem to get worse and then even out? And the answer is, for Parkinson's disease, it does progress. Everybody has progression. Ah, 
And right in the front row is Barb Mertz. Please stand up. Barb Mertz is our uh, research nurse. Our new research nurse has been with us since June. And uh, we're delighted that you are here. And we have some handouts that if you have any questions about that, she'll be delighted to ask, answer. So is there a gen everybody progresses with Parkinson's disease. The rate of progression varies from person to person. And some people may kind of seem to stay steady for a while, and then things may get worse or not. And how fast does it do? Does it go for each person is really quite variable. In general, there are some information and data that suggests people who start with tremor or shaking tend to progress a bit more slowly and tend to progress more slowly than people who don't start with that. But again, there's so much overlap it's really hard to predict. So kind of like the stock market, the past performance is not a bad predictor of the future, but I wouldn't bank on it. So you don't know for sure. Dr. Martin, do you have anything to add about that? What happened to your microphone? Oh. No, no, I, I agree with everything that you say. It, it, people do slowly progress. Everybody's different. But um, what I tell patients is that Generally speaking, things are going to continue to progress at the same rate that they have thus far, just like you said. And sometimes if there seems to be a severe worsening over a short time, that may reflect something else going on, some intercurrent or additional stress like the flu, or I don't think anybody ever has any interactions or conflicts with their spouse, but any kind of stress <laughs> may make things worse, even constipation if it gets really out of control, can temporarily make things worse. And then after the time of stress, it usually comes back toward baseline. All right, I'm going to move on to another question. Can Parkinson's affect my esophagus? Or as my anatomy professor would say, esophagus. And, and this particular person goes on to ask, my gastroenterologist, their GI doctor, told me that their chest pains were not heart related, but may be caused by Parkinson's, and that has recently found that tremors can cause muscle spasms of the esophagus that stimulate, that simulate angina or heart pain or, or belly pain. Well, that's a bunch of things mixed up, but let's attack it directly. So the first answer is swallowing problems are very, very common in Parkinson's disease. And as we published, and many people have published over the years, and our paper was 25 years ago, I guess now. Thank you. It was, uh, who was the? Um, but yeah, Linda Neal. And, yeah. So one of the major problems with swallowing is actually first moving the food from the front of the mouth to the back, then initiating the swallowing. Sometimes food or liquids may not go down in a proper way. So normally when you swallow, there are two pipes you have choices. You prefer to use the esophagus, so it goes down into your stomach. That's where food gets absorbed better or at least gets uh, chopped up, uh, as opposed to going down the windpipe into the lungs. And there's some protective mechanisms that may not always work adequately and may become impaired in Parkinson's such that some food or liquid can go down the wrong way. We call that aspiration. And a person may not even be aware of that. Other people feel that food sticks in their throat, and they may identify that. And then there's a whole host of strategies that can be uh, used to identify the specific nature of the swallowing problem. And with speech pathologists work, speech pathologists, by the way, not only do voice, but also are experts in swallowing, then they can work on maneuvers to help uh, improve swallowing and make ensure that food or help increase their chance that food and liquid goes down the right way. So yes, it's common. It's usually not painful, although occasionally when food sticks in the esophagus, that can be painful. There is some less, uh, less, um, less work has been done on the function of the lower part of the esophagus as it hits the stomach, which can crunch down and cause esophageal spasm. So do you have any information about that? Not really. I think it's worth uh cautioning people not to assume that they have chest pain, not to assume that it's an esophageal problem related to their Parkinson's. That's they may have angina. Right. So just because you have Parkinson's doesn't protect you from heart problems. Very good point. 
So what I've been talking about mostly is difficulties with swallowing, not so much pain on swallowing. So if you have pain, you really need to be checked out by your doctor. Good point. Next question. I cannot urinate. Oh, that's what they were asking, not me. I'm sorry. Okay. The urologist seemed to say this was due to Parkinson's. Is this true? What causes it? Is there something I can take that is safe with PD to take? All very good questions. So uh, in men, difficulties with urination, hesitancy, getting the flow going, incomplete uh, emptying of the bladder, dribbling, all can be signs of an enlarged prostate as it squeezes down on that tube that comes through the penis called the urethra, the, which you empty the bladder, and very similar manifestations can occur with Parkinson's. And in women, it's less confused with prostate, right, because women don't have prostates, uh, but they can have exactly the same symptoms. Uh, dribbling uh, can also be a problem with prolapsed bladder that can occur after childbirth as well. So yes, their uh, difficulties with urinating can absolutely be part of Parkinson's, but like chest pains are not necessarily part of it. Uh, there are a number of different medications to try to help with that. And uh, is it safe to take them with PD? It may be and in some people it may not be. And so there are different kinds of problems that affect the bladder. One group of problems is, very, is frequent urination, and so medicines that help reduce that frequency, particularly waking up in the night, they have to urinate a whole bunch of times, which can interrupt sleep and make people sleep deprived. There are medicines to, to treat that, and some of those medicines are what we call anticholinergic medicines. They have an effect like that, which is a medicine that used to be I guess occasionally still used to treat for Parkinson's, I would be very cautious with them because they can cause substantial problems. So anybody who's more mature, anybody who has any kind of thinking problems or trouble uh, concentrating, anybody who has a substantial amount of constipation, those things can definitely be made worse by anticholinergics and many of the medicines that are given for bladder. So one has to be very cautious. In men, there's medicine given to help increase the flow, like Tamsulosin, which the trade name is Flomax. That doesn't have that thinking problem so much, but what it can do that may interfere for some people, not all, is it can cause blood pressure to drop substantially when standing up. And so that can be a problem already in people with Parkinson's. The medicines we normally give for Parkinson's to help the movement can make that worse, and Tamsulosin or Flomax in some people can make that worse. So if you need to take that, you must do it with caution and make sure you talk to your Parkinson's doctor before starting other medications. At least that would be my advice. Okay. I got that one right. Phew. All right, I have been experiencing frequent cramped leg muscles while sleeping, while just sitting for a while, and when moving quickly as in a recent game of competitive table tennis. Now this guy's talking my language here. Uh, I played a lot of table tennis. For those who are more mature, probably nobody mature enough, my father was first in the country in doubles in the early 40s, second in the country in singles in the NCAAs, but lost to his doubles partner. But I digressed. What was the question? Oh yes, um, <laughs> leg cramps. And are these Parkinson related symptoms and what can I do to reduce the onset and reduce the pain? So the answer is yes, they very well may be. They don't have to be, but they're co that's a common manifestation. So leg cramps can occur really as Leg and foot cramps and toe curling can be the first manifestation of Parkinson's in some people. Everybody with leg cramps doesn't have Parkinson's or not doomed to get it. But that can be, for some people, uh, an early manifestation. It also can be a manifestation that's related to treatment. So when somebody takes levodopa or carbidopa levodopa, the medicine kicks in, wear, lasts for a period of time, may wear off. And some people, if they don't, and I keep harassing when they come into my office, how long does it take to kick in? How long does it last? When does it wear off? But early in the course and with milder PD, you don't notice those kinds of fluctuations. 
The reason I bring up the fluctuations, as the medicine's kicking in, some people can get cramps in the leg. While it's working, occasionally people do, that's less common. When it's wearing off, it can occur. And when it's off, when the medicine's worn off altogether, like in the middle of the night, is a very common time for those cramps. We call that off period dystonia. And dystonia means abnormal muscle tone or a, a tightness. And they can be sufficiently severe to hurt. Some people notice as soon as they get up and stand and walk a bit, it'll relieve it to some degree. But for some people, it's, it's bothersome. So how can uh, you reduce this? If it's related to medication, there are a variety of things of adjustment of medication that may be effective. Uh, some people even suggest stretching the calves at night before going to bed. Uh, that has the fewest side effects unless you stretch too far and break something. Uh, that's bad. Some people even take a warm bath at night uh, prior to. But really, this is one that it's the best thing to do is to try to identify the pattern as to when the cramps occur with respect to the timing of medication, because that'll help you and your caregiver, your doctor, figure out what's the best approach. Okay, sometimes it requires more medicine, sometimes it requires medicine at night that lasts longer than the usual type medicine. So there's a variety of approaches for that. Yeah, I don't have anything to add to that, just to say that some of you may be aging, and, um, Cramps are a common part of the whole aging process and certainly happens in people whether or not they have Parkinson's. And especially if you're playing competitive sports that use the legs, it's common to get cramps after that. I notice when I run long distance, like you're making me do with this crazy go marathon thing, that I will have cramps that night and probably in preparation for it in a substantial way. So yes, that can be part of the deal. So, so far we're due, oh, one more here about manifestations early on. It says, my husband was diagnosed with Parkinson's three years ago and has been struggling with dementia. So troubles with concentration, troubles with thinking, later troubles with memory, although that's not usually the prominent feature of Parkinson's. He is presently taking Nemenda and Aricept. Those are two medicines that have been uh, recommended for people with Alzheimer's disease. But I read recently that the drug Exelon is better for Parkinson's patients with dementia. Is it worth trying to change medicines? Please discuss dementia and Parkinson's and how it differs from Lewy body disease and Alzheimer's. So now you're going to go right into my wheelhouse. Okay? This is one of our big major studies that we're doing that Barb is coordinating. And, uh, and that is to figure out what causes thinking problems in Parkinson's. And I'm going to start off by saying it's a big deal. And a lot of people with Parkinson's down the road may develop some challenges with their thinking. And this is one thing that I'll tell you right up front, we do not have good treatment for. The most important thing when this develops is number one, avoid medicines that make it worse. Because sometimes we find that just adjusting medicines, like that bladder medicine, may have made thinking worse and we can help relieve it. Sometimes people with depression can ha and depression we know is more common in people with Parkinson's than people without Parkinson's, can have what appears to be dementia and not really dementia. So appropriate treatment of, de of depression can be a very important treatment to help people's thinking. So those are very critical. So let me tell you what I used to do that was completely wrong and I'll tell you how come. So I used to teach that when dementia occurs in people with Parkinson's, half the time it was due to the same process that causes Parkinson's, which is we know that there's an abnormal protein that's deposited in the brain. We call that alpha-synuclein, and it starts in the back part, lower part of the brain, and when it affects the parts of the brain that have to do with uh, movement, we see the movement problems, and shaking may occur, or slow walking, and slowness of movement but that alpha-synuclein can also affect higher parts of the brain and may cause thinking problems. And those higher parts are up here, easy to see on my head. Okay, so, and I used to say the other half of the people had coexisting, or in addition to, Parkinson's, 
also had Alzheimer's disease. Okay, so I'm going to tell you something because of the research that people in this room have participated in and others, that story, at least my opinion of that story, it's wrong. And so here's what we now know, and that is every person that we see with Parkinson's who has had thinking problems that we see in our movement disorder center and follow, when we, if they stay with us long enough so when they no longer need their brain, we examine it because that's the only way you know the real answer. It turns out every single one of those people, and this is now a series up to 63 people, have alpha-synuclein throughout the brain. And in Alzheimer's disease, there is a different abnormal protein. In fact, Alzheimer's is greedy. They have two abnormal proteins. One is called A-beta, and another is called tau. And A-beta is likely to be abnormal in the brain first, even maybe before the symptoms of Alzheimer's start. And in fact, people who have familial Alzheimer's, that's probably what, that is well known now. And then once thinking problems start with Alzheimer's, there's also tau, abnormal tau. So you see both of those proteins to a very marked degree. And what we found in our people with Parkinson's is they all had alpha-synuclein and about 60% also had a beta. So at first we thought, my gosh, they're going to have Alzheimer's. But son of a gun, if it wasn't less than 5% had abnormal tau. That's not Alzheimer's disease. So we, it can be seen, now the limitation of that work is that was done in people who come to us, a movement disorder center. That's not people who are going to a memory center where there may be a different type of person tending to go to that direction. So that's the limitation. How come that's important? It's important because of the question that was raised here. If we want to develop a new treatment to treat the thinking problems once they develop or even avoid them, we need to treat the disease that's causing it. If we give treatment for Alzheimer's disease, it may do nothing for the thinking problems with Parkinson's. So we started this study nine years ago, some time back. Sue, were you there when we first started this or was this after you? Uh, okay, I'm looking back to Sue Levin who was a major player in our chapter, the beginning of the chapter, started it and ran it for many, many, many years in a very superb way. So it's very important for us to sort that out. And when we started this study, we started it because there was a new kind of PET scan, a scan where you could lie down in a scan, lie down in the scanning machine and we could inject into your vein a medicine or a drug that would go to the brain and show us abnormal A-beta. And the reason we started this, we said, okay, we're going to take people with Parkinson's with or without any thinking problems and take people without Parkinson's, do these scans of A-beta, do a whole bunch of thinking tests, a whole bunch of analyses, even get spinal fluid from them because there's important me measures we can make there, and MR scans and follow them and see what happens with the idea that if the A-beta PET scan shows this abnormal A-beta, that they would be people with Alzheimer's. But we followed people long enough, and when they no longer needed their brain, then we studied it. And that's still part of the study, and a very important part of the study, a part of the study that my father was in. And we found, sorry for that pause, and we found that the study, the results that I showed you, that Alzheimer's was turned out to be very rare in our group, less than 5%. And that makes a difference. And we, so my colleagues in the Alzheimer's community said, well, maybe that's just early Alzheimer's disease because they have A beta and A beta is first and then tau comes later. But the advantage I have was I had a beard so I could do this and I could look over my glasses and I said, hmm, early. But these are people that were older and already severely demented 
and dead. How long do we have to wait? So it turned out we did an analysis of the A-beta scans, the PET scans, and saw that the distribution of the A-beta was different in Parkinson's compared to Alzheimer's, suggesting that they actually play a different role. We made measurements from the spinal fluid that were different from Alzheimer's. So the answer is, for us, we don't see Alzheimer's that commonly as causing this. So what about Namenda and Aricept? They've been demonstrated, and I say that loosely, to provide modest benefit in people with Alzheimer's. I would not say it's a dramatic effect. It may have a modest effect early on. We can hear another opinion about that. I know for sure that when you take those medicines, the drug companies are happy. Um, and there may be a role, to be fair about it. The data for it helping Parkinson's is far less convincing, and it's not all that great for Alzheimer's as it is. And there was one paper suggesting Exelon may be marginally better. I'm not sure that much other data has supported that. The data is really not very good. So is it worth changing medicines? Uh, is it worth starting the medicines? We get, you can talk to different neurologists, different Parkinson specialists with different notions about that. Some believe that they may help hallucinations. If people are seeing things that aren't there, that that could help. I'm less uh, convinced about that, but that's something some people s try. So if somebody's really pressed and wants to do it and it's not causing them problems, I don't really fight them on it, but I don't frequently suggest it. So of course I agree with all of that. Um, <laughs> that's why I asked him here, you know. <laughs> no. Next question. No. No. Um, it's drugs like Aricept um, and the related drugs were developed for treating Alzheimer's, but they're not specific to Alzheimer's disease. They act on chemicals in the brain, neurotransmitters in the brain, and there may be the same kind of abnormality in Parkinson's that may justify their use in Parkinson's, even though it hasn't necessarily been shown to be clearly effective. I agree that in Alzheimer's disease, it's only a modest benefit in early Alzheimer's disease. I suspect it's the same in Parkinson's. I don't think that any one of those drugs is any better than the other. Uh, it may be worth changing if, if uh, one drug has been tried and you're not seeing a significant benefit. It may be worth changing to a different drug. Uh, there is very little head-to-head -head comparison with these drugs in the literature. And the other thing, and you've mentioned this already, is that you really have to remember that all medications have potential side effects. And we spend a lot of our time in dealing with side effects. And we have to balance all of these medications. We have to balance the beneficial effect of the medications with the side effects. And sometimes the side effects are worse than the underlying problem that we're trying to treat. So we always have to keep those issues in mind. Thank you. Oh, next question. Are Parkinson's symptoms affected by either too much sleep or not enough sleep? Yes. Next question. <laughs> so sleep deprivation, which can be related to Parkinson's or unrelated to Parkinson's or related to uh, maturing, as I like to call it, as I've past that threshold in some cases. Uh, sleep deprivation is another form of stress that can make anything worse, including Parkinsonian features. So if one is constantly tired, that can be a problem. We believe, and there's increasing evidence about obstructive sleep apnea, so this is with people who snore a lot at night and intermittently wake up in the night and have very poor sleep. They have troubles with sleepiness in the daytime because they're not getting good rest at night. And that may be even more common in people with Parkinson's and Parkinson's-like conditions. There also can be troubles with uh, what we call REM behavior disorder. REM stands for rapid eye movement sleep. That's when we normally dream. And the normal behavior of the body when we dream is to disconnect the muscles of movement so that we don't act out our dreams. 
In REM behavior disorder, that disconnection does not occur as well. And so there may be kicking and screaming out loud. Those of you who sleep with somebody with Parkinson's, REM behavior disorder can be part of it. You may get a kick here and there. Uh, may or may not be related to REM behavior disorder. Check and see if the person's awake. If they're awake, it's not part of it. But that can be enough to knock somebody out of bed on, on occasion. So that can interfere with sleep as well. So they're really, can be a number of, and in fact, if somebody wakes up to urinate frequently through the night, that interferes with sleep, and sometimes it's tough, hard to get back to sleep, and if their medicine from the previous night, uh, previous before they went to bed, wears off, so they wake up and now they're slate, shaky and slow and have trouble moving, then that can be another source of difficulty falling back asleep. So yes, sleep is a very critical issue. It definitely can be affected by Parkinson's in many ways and not enough sleep can be a problem. And in addition, medicines that we give people for Parkinson's, including carbidopa, levodopa, but even more so the other drugs like uh, Pramipexol and Ropinirol and Rotigotine. Rotigotine's the patch and Pramipexol is Mirapax and Ropinirol is Requip. Those, makes, those are even more likely to produce sleepiness. So excessive daytime sleepiness can be from medications, which then can interfere with sleeping at night. And Parkinson's alone, even without medication, can cause excessive daytime sleepiness. So there can be a multiple causes of sleep problems associated with Parkinson's and with the medications. In addition, if there needs to be another addition to this, is sometimes people who have their blood pressure drop when they're standing makes them feel lightheaded. That makes it easy to identify, which can be part of Parkinson's, and the medicines frequently make that worse. That blood pressure can be really low, even with somebody just sitting, and that can be a cause of sleepiness. So I had one person in my office who was complaining of excessive daytime sleepiness, and their sitting blood pressure, sitting blood pressure, was 72 over 40 in my office. That's a low number. Standing up, amazingly, they were still awake and the pressure was 60 over 40. So that's, you know, there are lots of, of uh, issues here which can be related to medications and underlying Parkinson's or unrelated. So yes, any sleep problem can definitely make Parkinson's worse. So like I said before, we have to balance the beneficial effects of medication right. with the side effects. All right, it seems that fatigue is something that comes along with the disease, yes. What do you instruct patients that sleep all night and then get up and want to lie down more? Seems like lying down in the daytime just makes the nighttime sleep. So it's a little bit of what I talked about already. And so the rest of that sentence was, it seems that the, nighttime, the daytime sleeping or napping in the day tends to make their sleep at night worse, and that's correct. We call that poor sleep hygiene. And so if somebody's having trouble sleeping at night and they're sleeping too much in the daytime and they take naps of a two or three hours, two or three times in the day, then there's not much time left for sleeping at night and so everything gets mixed up. And so trying to stay awake in the daytime is important. So what do we instruct? As Dr. Martin would remind me, first thing we do is we check medicines that are making that worse and adjust them uh, properly. And it could be the Parkinson's medicines. It could be antidepressant medication. It could be any host of medicines. And we try to reduce or eliminate those that are particularly bad. And even if we do all of that and have people just on carbidopa, levodopa, which is probably the most effic efficacious with relatively fewer side effects when there gets to be problems and still has too much sleepiness, then we may try to give something to help somebody stay awake, like caffeine, for example, first time, you know, in the morning and maybe at noon as well, but not later because that will interfere with sleep as well. But again, those specifics need to be discussed with your doctor because there are potential side effects of caffeine. And if somebody has heart irregularity, that's not a good choice. And if somebody has, uh, you know, they're constantly urinating all the time, that could be a, an issue for that. So there are a lot of other potential problems. And there are some other drugs that we occasionally try that are much more expensive. But caffeine is a, a good first way after eliminating the offending other drugs. Yeah. OK. The body has this next question. Uh, oh, I love this one. 
My question, this person says, is about the relationship, if any, of Parkinson's through the skeletal vertebra. Does deformation of any vertebra affect the path of receiving medication or brain impulses? Wow, what a question. This is really cool. So the, you know, the easy answer would say, oh, no, no, that's silly. But no, there's, there's really more to it than this. So, the, let's, so first of all, let me give you a little lecture on anatomy. Brain is up here. It sends nerves down through the neck, through the spinal column, okay? And it goes through the spinal cord. And around the spinal cord sits encased in the vertebra, which has a space for them to go through. And if the vertebra gets scrunched as we get, more, as we get older, or wear and tear as we get arthritis of the vertebra, it can push on that. And that indeed can interfere with impulses coming down from the brain to the rest of the body. That's not usually a Parkinson's problem, okay? That can cause pain, it can cause weakness, it can cause bladder problems, it can cause constipation, it can make people paralyzed even if it's really bad. So there are lots of different ways that vertebral or vertebra problems of the bony vertebra that can actually interfere, and even the cushions between the vertebra are called discs. They can pop out and squish on to the nerves that are coming out or even onto the spinal cord itself. So yes, that can be true. Does it have anything to dopamine production? Not any way, shape, or form that I'm aware of. So I think it's totally unrelated to the major manifestations of Parkinson's. Now there is one overlap, I would say, and is people with Parkinson's, if they have a lot of stiffness in their back and they have poor posture because of that, that can tend to exacerbate some of these musculoskeletal problems of the spine and cause positioning that makes, can make things worse. So in that way, indirectly, there can be an interaction between Parkinson's and skeletal problems. But again, this is not something that really affects dopamine production. Dopamine is that major chemical messenger that's uh, missing in the brain. Although if you were at the fashion show, you'd know that, in fact, there are other chemicals that may be lost just as much or even more than dopamine in the brain in people with Parkinson's. And from that study we're doing, we also found another chemical messenger, norepinephrine, is even lost to a greater degree in higher parts of the brain, which may give us new targets for treatment which is a big deal. So participating in that study has played off and provided incredible benefit potentially down the road. Um, skeletal, any other comments about skeletal vertebrae? I probably beat that one to death. Just remember, we talked about the aging thing before, and arthritis in the neck and the lower back is really part of normal aging, but it doesn't have a direct relationship to dopamine right. production in Parkinson's. Right. The body, next question. The body has symptoms to regulate the production of chemicals such as insulin and neurotransmitters. What is the regulatory system that turns on and off dopamine production? Let's let you do that first. Uh. So dopamine is, is produced continuously in the brain by the neurons that are affected in Parkinson's. Um, it, it's trapped within vesicles, within little pouches of, of uh, dopamine within the nerve endings. And the dopamine is then released to interact with the next nerve cell in, in the chain of command uh, in response to activation of those neurons. So in Parkinson's, it's the impaired synthesis of dopamine, the, the uh, impaired ability to produce dopamine from the underlying amino acids, which are the, the uh, underlying uh, basic compounds from which dopamine is produced. You can continue. So there are uh, feedback systems in the brain to try to control that to some degree. They're really swamped by what happens with Parkinson's. So if there's too much dopamine released, then it feeds back and tries to turn down the synthesis. There are questions about interactions with other chemical messengers that may potentially control dopamine synthesis. But by and large, those things are not really a factor. A bigger factor 
is not what goes on in our bodies, but what people give to our bodies. So there are chemicals and drugs that can be given that block the action of dopamine. And in fact, that can be sufficiently severe to cause Parkinson's symptoms in somebody who doesn't have any Parkinson's disease at all. And also can make worse Parkinson's for those who have it. In fact, one or two doses can make it worse for a month or two and can be a real problem. So I know there's a lot of direct-to-consumer advertising, not that I would mention a drug specifically like Abilify, uh, <laughs> that is used to potentiate or improve your treatment of depression all over the TV. And I've had, I can tell you, the one person I took care of, Parkinson's, doing perfectly fine, had bad depression, was given Abilify to help improve their depression, couldn't go to work because Parkinson's was doubled in severity because of that drug. So drugs that don't really affect dopamine directly but affect the action of dopamine can be a real problem. And so that's, that's a big issue. And, and other drugs that affect stomach, like metoclopramide or Reglan, can be another one that can substantially exacerbate Parkinson's. I love to see dyskinesias, people who have their head going like this, which says, yes, yes, I agree with everything you're saying, so keep it going. It's good. It's all good. All right. Let's move on to a different category, and we're going to go on to the category about diagnosis. What about the news report, October 23rd, 2015, that early PD can be detected by smell? It sounds bizarre, but when testing this... Okay. So this came out, there was a great story, hit a bunch of papers around the world. And there was a woman in England, I believe. Yep, thank you for the confirmation. And I will ask Debbie some answers of questions too. It's always good. We can take help, and seriously, from any places, good. So uh, she had, I believe, a spouse with Parkinson's, and she said she could detect his Parkinson's by smelling him. And she told this to her doctor, who was most intrigued by this and they followed up in a pretty cool scientific study. The doctor went to 12 people, six with Parkinson's and six without Parkinson's, and took from these people T-shirts that they had worn prior to washing them, put them in bags, marked them, coded them, did not identify whether the T-shirt came from somebody with Parkinson's or without Parkinson's, and she took the T-shirts out and sniffed them. And then she determined whether that person had Parkinson's or didn't. And 11 of the 12, she correctly identified. It's pretty good. But here's the best part. The one person that did not have Parkinson's that she said did have Parkinson's, that's the one that was wrong, eight months later developed it. Pretty cool. So we were going to get her nose and put it in the lab. So there may be something that is excreted in the sweat or something like that that is detectable. So it's a very interesting thing. It's early days, and, and it's not reasonable to send her around. Maybe expert dogs could be developed for that. There's all kinds of things. Or maybe somebody could just walk in the office and we can see if they have Parkinson's too. That might be easier. There's no evidence that it helps distinguish Parkinson's disease from other Parkinsonian states. That would be something very useful, but there's no no study of that even at all. But it's kind of an interesting report. So I, I was very delighted to get that question. I had to look that one up to find it. But that was interesting. All right. Here's another one. I have non-classical Parkinson's. And by that I mean I do not have tremors or arm muscle rigidity. But I have everything else. And I'm taking two tablets of 25100 carbidopa levodopa. That's the yellow ones three times a day for my Parkinson's. One side effect of the drug is to increase my imbalance. I fall a lot. In other words, it's making the person worse when they take the medicine. The amount of imbalance I have during the day varies. Normally, after taking my pills, my imbalance in increases and then slowly gets better until the next time I take the pills. Any recommendations for treating this side effect? So the first thing that needs to be sorted out is what the heck is going on, all right? So question number one is, does that person have true Parkinson's disease? That's one question. 
that's not always an easy answer to sort out, and no, no scan will distinguish that. I'll just throw that out there. We can talk about that more. And then the question is, could the medicine be doing something that's actually making the imbalance worse, as this person suggests? And the answer to that, yes, there are a couple of possibilities. So, for ex but I don't know if it's the case for this person. And that makes all the difference, and you have to sort that out. So, for example, if the medicine caused dystonia or a cramping of the foot and the foot turning in, then walking balance could be thrown off. Okay? That's one way it could happen. If the medicine caused the blood pressure to drop more when standing up, then that person could be imbalanced. A lot of times we think when blood pressure is dropping too much, people feel lightheaded like they're going to faint. But that's not the only symptom that may develop, and so this can be tricky. It may not, that symptom may not be there at all. It may be just a sense of imbalance. It may be just pain in the back of the neck and up on the shoulders. And a guy, Steve Rich at uh, University of Maryland calls that hanger sign because it's kind of where a hanger holds a shirt. And that's because not enough blood flow gets to those muscles and causes them to ache. And so that can be another sign. One person I had told me they just feel weak in the knees, but they don't feel lightheaded at all, and her pressure was dropping to 64 over 40 also, standing up. So that was a major sign that went away when we treated that. So there can be other things from DOPA or other medications that can increase the imbalance. Uh, so the question is, in this person, what's the diagnosis? And we don't have enough information to know that. Uh, we do know that not everybody with Parkinson's develops a tremor, and it's not at all uncommon to not have a tremor. So whether there is one or not doesn't help a great deal in making the diagnosis. And about a third of people don't have tremors, what I usually say. Right. Um, and the other thing is, is why is this person receiving medication? Just because we make a diagnosis of Parkinson's doesn't mean that we need to start medication in a given individual. We don't treat the diagnosis, we treat the symptoms. So if there's enough disability associated with the symptoms, then we may want to start medication. If there is not significant disability, and we discuss this with the patients, if there isn't sufficient disability to justify <coughs> taking medication, then there's no reason to start, and there, there's, it's perfectly safe to wait a year or two years or however long it may take uh, until the diagnosis is more clear and until the symptoms really do merit treating with medication. Many patients that I see, when I explain this to them, they say, well, okay, I really don't want to take medication, and if I don't have to, I won't. That's fine. Okay. Next question. Thank you. For that. It appears that Parkinson's disease can sometimes be difficult to diagnose. Uh, then they asked, could I explain what a positive result for blood test code 559 PARK2, parentheses Parkin, DNA sequencing test, and blood test code 554 PARK7, DJ1, DNA sequencing test mean? Sure, that's obvious. <laughs> So when, when I asked Dr. Martin about this one, we both raised our uh, eyebrows. I, I think I actually know what you're talking about here, but the, the blood test code is not something we would normally deal with. And I was just wondering if that person is here, if that's from 23andMe, they're getting a blood test code, or somewhere they're getting a code. But they identified actually what gene. So the issue is this. There are rare causes of specific genetic mutations that can lead to Parkinson's disease. One of them is Parkin, and that was their code 559. One of them is even more rare, is PARK7 or DJ1. So both of those can lead to it. The trick here is that Parkin is actually a very big set of genes, and there can be many different kinds of abnormalities in that gene that unless it's sequenced, in other words, every single part of the gene is analyzed, which is a more expensive way to go as opposed to looking for a common mutation there, you cannot exclude that you have an abnormality there. If an, an abnormality is identified, 
I don't know which one that is, but if it's one of the common ones that actually causes Parkinson's disease, then that means that person has an increased, a very increased chance of developing Parkinson's disease. Not everybody with the gene abnormality does, however, develop Parkinson's disease. DJ1 abnormality is far less common. Oh, and to go in further, Parkin, that genetic abnormality, tends to occur when it does cause gen, uh, gene abnormality, tends to cause younger onset Parkinson's disease. So those people generally start before age 45, not exclusively, but generally. DJ1 also is a younger onset Parkinson's. It's far less common. I don't think we have enough data, and maybe you can help me about this, I don't think there's enough data to tell us if one has the mutation, what the risk of then developing Parkinson's disease is. It's certainly greater than not having the mutation. But there are gene abnormalities, for example, you can have the gene abnormality and have only a one in three or one in four chance of ever developing a disease in your lifetime. I don't know if that information is yet known about DJ1 since it's so uncommon. Do you know? So that's called, that's called penetrance. When you have it, does it, how common does it really cause that? So would this definitely confirm a PD diagnosis? The first thing you should know is a lack of finding it doesn't tell you anything. And since we're in this place, it doesn't tell you bubkis. So for those who don't know what that means, that's a Yiddish term meaning basically nothing. All right. Uh, and uh, additional information, Parkinson's does run in the family, mother and aunt, and so is it inherited, which is really a very important question. And the answer is there may be, and there is, a heritable component of Parkinson's. Most people don't have it run in families. In our center, we have about 15 or 20 percent of people have a relative, a first degree relative, so it's parent, brother, sister, uh, that have Parkinson's disease also. But that's far less than the risk of somebody with just Parkinson's disease sending it down to a child. It's much, much less than that. Of those people, so the most common genetic defect that we know about today for Parkinson's disease is a genetic defect we call LERC2. That most common one for those people who just have Parkinson's disease without even a family history, about 1% will have that gene abnormality. If you have Parkinson's in your family, strong family history, then your risk of having that gene abnormality in St. Louis, because we did this study and published it, is 2.9% or 3%, still very low. Now, there are two exceptions to that risk of that, again, just I'm speaking about the most common genetic defect. And that most common genetic defect, LERC2, is much higher in Arabs from North Africa if they have Parkinson's and it runs in the family, then the chance of having that gene abnormality is about 30 or 40 percent. In Jews from Eastern Europe or Ashkenazi Jews, if they have it run in the family, familial Parkinson's, their risk of having that gene defect may be around 20 percent. So there are some cases. Overall, we think the genetic risks may represent 20 to 25 percent of the risk factors in total with all kinds of things. But I think we have a lot more to learn about this. And so, yes, there is some heritable component, but just because you have PD doesn't put your family at really a substantially much greater risk. Okay. All right. Can Parkinson's cause any physical pain? How does one distinguish between pain caused by PD and other pains such as arthritis? So I didn't group this one into the right group, but I'll take it now. And how do you treat the pain? And the, the treat the pain based upon what causes the pain. And as Dr. Martin has emphasized multiple times, if you have a pain, you need to sort it out. Can pain be part of Parkinson's? Absolutely. Is the pain, you know, uh, go away when medicine kicks in for your Parkinson's and then gets, uh, uh, and gets worse when the medicine wears off? That would be a clue it could be related. But it doesn't necessarily be, that could be the only cause of that pain. That could just be exacerbating something underlying. So again, pain is one of those things you really need to go through the details with your doctor about, whether it's leg pain or neck pain or shoulder pain or arm pain, all of those things. There's too many, too many possibilities 
about that. But I can tell you there are a number of people that have been sent to me by physical therapists because they went with a pain in their shoulder, the physical therapist, and they started off with uh, tendonitis in the shoulder, and the therapist, as opposed to their internist or family practitioner, uh, noticed that they weren't swinging the arm right, and they were a little stiff, and may have had a little shake or not having a shake, and sent them to us, and they turned out to be Parkinson's. But you know what? There are a lot more people with shoulder pains that don't have Parkinson's than do. So there's a lot of overlap in that one, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't uh, jump on that so much. Okay. I'm learning from him so I know what he was going to say, so I, you know, was proactive. Please discuss the use of colonoscopy. Oh, there's more. Okay. Uh, David Perlmutter, I'm going to digress for a moment. David, David Perlmutter, and not the David Perlmutter in Florida that I wouldn't say is a quack unless you ask me. This is David Perlmutter, who's coming to be dean of the medical school at Washington University from the University of Pittsburgh, who's actually a uh, pediatrician. He's a very bright, wonderful guy, did a lot of GI work, actually, in, in the past. Why did I say that? I have no idea. Okay, so colonoscopy to secure a biopsy and diagnose PD before motor symptoms appear. Uh, well, it turns out in the colon and in the GI tract, there are patches of nerves, and those patches of nerves may, in fact, be affected by Parkinson's, and likely are, with that protein. Remember I talked about alpha-synuclein? Can even identify alpha-synuclein on those in a biopsy and looking at it under a microscope. So if you prefer to get a colonoscopy with a biopsy rather than coming to a neurologist to have him look at the way you walk and talk to him, that would be an approach. I personally think that would be a pain in the <laughs> bottom. And I'm not sure about the specificity of that finding, although that, that has, uh, there could be some interesting research done there. But it's probably not the most efficacious way to go for the diagnosis. Do you have another thought about that bottom line problem? <laughs> <laughs> Right. In fact, there was one study that looked at and didn't reproduce the earlier findings from another study. But then people argue about how they did the, bio, how they did the analysis with the staining of the, of the tissue, et cetera. Was the biopsy deep enough to capture the area? There's a whole bunch of stuff there. But it's probably not the best way to go right now. Interesting. The point is that yeah. if you don't have symptoms yet, there's no advantage. That's true. A screening colonoscopy for Parkinson's among most of the people in the country would not be a reasonable approach. <laughs> there are probably less invasive approaches that might be more useful. Is there, a, and that brings us right to this next one. Is there a risk profile of what a pre-Parkinson's patient may look like, or precursors? In other words, is there something some set of uh, findings that we can identify that would predict development of Parkinson's. So let's address what Dr. Wayne Martin said first. Right now, that wouldn't make a difference right now. It will make a difference if once we develop a medicine that could forestall treatment, if that medicine was not too noxious and caused too many side effects, then there could be a good reason for wanting to make that diagnosis earlier and starting medication earlier. Right now, we don't have that. But nevertheless, in anticipation of developing such a uh, medication, there's been a lot of effort to investigate this. And there's a whole series of things that people have been looking at. So I'll just give you a litany or a list of some of those things. And the first thing to keep in mind is none of these are specific for developing Parkinson's disease alone. So a lot of people have these conditions who never develop Parkinson's. So that's really an important point. So what do they include? Constipation, number one. A lot of people are stopped up and don't get Parkinson's, okay? But constipation may be a very early manifestation because of what we were talking about, because of the alpha-synuclein. In fact, it's such an interesting thing. Some people have suggested that the alpha-synuclein, that abnormal protein in the brain, first starts by some, in the GI tract and travels up nerves to the lower part of the brain and then gets uh, spread that way. So that remains to be determined, but people are looking at that. 
So constipation moment. Next one, Lo loss of sense of smell, which translates into loss of taste because smell is 70% of taste. That can occur before symptoms of Parkinson's. How about another one? REM behavior disorder, those people who in the night kick and scream and uh, have scary dreams, that can occur in people with Parkinson way before other manifestations develop. Let's do another one, restless legs syndrome. So that's where you get this creepy crawly feeling in your legs, particularly at night, but it can occur in the day sitting down. And the key thing, as soon as you stand up and walk, it goes away immediately. That's restless legs. can be associated with low iron, actually, it turns out. And that can be an early manifestation or be associated with subsequent development of Parkinson. But again, all of those things occur way more commonly in people who don't develop Parkinson's. But those things may occur. And so people are looking at can a combination of those things be more predictive? Can a combination of those things with a particular scan or a particular test of how fast somebody moves their finger predict development of Parkinson's? The answer is it may be the case. And so there's increasing data and people are working on that. But right now, that doesn't matter until we get a medicine that can forestall Parkinson's disease. It's safe to take. Uh, depression is the other thing ah, that, right. that can, can occur for all sorts of reasons, but it can be a precursor of Parkinson's. Good. Thank you. Okay. Is feeling lightheaded a consequence of Parkinson's, not simply upon arising or orthostatic, but throughout the day? So that kind of goes back to what we were talking about earlier, and that is, so some people, when they stand up, their blood pressure drops and they feel lightheaded. Some people, and that happens when they stand up, but some people can feel lightheaded just sitting because their blood pressure is dropping even at that point. If they're lying down and feel lightheaded, then it's less likely a drop in blood pressure issue, although it's worth measuring the blood pressure at that time. Drops in blood pressure can definitely be part of Parkinson's. Now, the real question I think is, can somebody complain of lightheadedness who's not having a blood pressure problem? And the answer to that is yes because people can ascribe unsteadiness when they stand up, an imbalance. It gets interpreted by people in different ways. And so some people, usually lightheadedness refers to drop in blood pressure, but I think there's some fuzziness in how each of us thinks of that term and what they associate with what's going on in their body. So the first thing I would check is a blood pressure, but it's not the only thing. And it could be just unsteadiness from the Parkinson's, postural instability, so trouble maintaining proper balance, position. People with Parkinson's, as you know, tend to flex more, and that can give a sense of unsteadiness because your center of gravity gets thrown off, particularly if you tend to propulse or go forward. So those are all reasons for feeling unsteady, and some people interpret that as lightheaded. Any other lightheaded thoughts? No. Okay. All right. Uh, Moving down, related conditions. How do you differentiate, they're asking me, how do I differentiate between atypical park, among the atypical Parkinson's disorders? And they listed progressive supranuclear palsy, multiple systems atrophy, cortical basal degeneration. I'll throw in their vascular Parkinsonism. So these are other causes of similar symptoms, of Parkinson's symptoms. All of these things can cause slowness, shuffling gait, soft speech, may or may not have tremor associated with that, unsteadiness. Some of them can cause thinking problems. In fact, PSP and cortical basal very commonly do that. MSA, we're having big discussions about that right now. We were thinking about that as one research topic for this couple of weeks. Uh, so how do we differentiate them? And with some challenge. So the best Parkinson's specialists are 99% accurate in their diagnosis of Parkinson's disease. But they don't check brains. So they really have no clue. And I would say the only way a physician will really know how good they are is if after somebody dies, they routinely try to obtain the brain to see what the diagnosis is. And then when that's done, I can tell you it's at best, well, in the range of 90% is how accurate we are in that range, maybe a little bit better. And it changes the longer we follow somebody. And here are the clues. 
the clues are typical Parkinsonism, good response to medication that's sustained. And by sustained, I mean it's not just good response in the first year or two, but last five or six or seven years. That's more likely to be Parkinson's. And having just said that, I can tell you that alone isn't 100% accurate. Because we've had people that have had good response for five and six years and turn out to have MSA instead of Parkinson's disease. So the key thing here is that these other conditions don't respond to medication in general as well as Parkinson's disease. Among the choices, if you had a choice, Parkinson's disease is a better choice because in general it responds better. Deep brain stimulation can help Parkinson's disease. It doesn't help these others. Okay? So we don't want to do deep brain stimulators in somebody, so it's very important for us to sort that out. Scanning, people have looked at MRI scans. There are a few findings on MRI scans that are kind of suggestive, but they are really not sufficiently good enough to help us distinguish. There are some clinical features of, for example, progressive supranuclear palsy, about how people move their eyes, and that's suggestive of it. Progressive supranuclear palsy tends to be more stiffness of the neck than the arms. They tend to develop troubles with thinking early on, early troubles with swallowing and speech. Those are the clues for PSP. But even that is not 100% accurate. The multi-systems atrophies may have more severe drops in blood pressure, more troubles with urination early on. But again, those things can overlap with Parkinson's disease. Those are the things that kind of push us one way or the other, but they're not absolutes. Cortical basal degeneration can look just like PSP, but also can be very asymmetric with people getting funny posturing of a hand like this. They may get jerks, their hand may wander around like this. That's much less common in Parkinson's disease, so that would be more suggestive, but it doesn't happen that often in cortical basal. So that only happens 15% of the time. So there are some clues that can clinically tell us one versus the other. The most important thing you should know, right now it would not affect how we would treat you with medication. It would not make a difference. In all cases, we still, if you need it, would try carbidopa, levodopa, or medicines like that. And they may have less chance of helping, but they may help even in these other conditions early on and take advantage of it. Where we would treat you differently is if you did, had carbidopa, levodopa, and you had short duration of action of each dose, and there was all kinds of complications with involuntary movements and stuff like that, and we think about deep brain stimulation, we would not want to do that if we thought you had one of these other conditions. So that's the biggest difference. Other thoughts? So what I always tell my patients is that I'm pretty sure I know what the diagnosis is, but the only way to confirm it is to take your brain out and look at it under a microscope. And so far, nobody has taken me out on that. I bring that up the first time I meet anybody. And uh, a lot of people volunteer, but they usually wait a long time. <laughs> As I say, only give me your brain when you no longer need it. All right. Next question. Oh, this is related. My mother was Dr. Samer Tabal's patient. Samer Tabal was one of our uh, docs here, was really wonderfully, is a wonderful guy. He's not gone. He's just gone from St. Louis, and he's still in Beirut. And uh, that was a challenging thing, but he had to go there for his family. Anyway, my mother was Dr. Samer Tabal's patient from 2004 until her death in 2010. Dr. Tabal diagnosed her with cortical basal ganglionic degeneration. Though she was first diagnosed with Parkinson's six years earlier when her symptoms first appeared. Losing her left a big void in my life. She was my best friend, etc. So this person goes on to say they tried a bunch of medicines. They never really provided much benefit, which is a typical scenario for people with cortical basal degeneration. That probably responds even less than the others in my experience. In fact, I don't think I've ever seen it provide benefit, but we always try. Um, and so they asked me, can I speak about scientific challenges for research and what's going on with that? And the answer is, 
you know, it's far less common, and the truth is there's far less research on this, and that's because it's less common. There may be spillover between, from research done on Parkinson's and research done on Alzheimer's for cortical basal. Cortical basal uh, degeneration is actually caused by a different protein problem in the brain. It's caused by tau, related more to Alzheimer's, although the symptoms are more similar to Parkinson's disease, but there's some overlap. So advances in those other areas and understanding how various protein abnormalities come about in the brain with this whole class of conditions may very well give us new insights to cortical basal. But as far as research directed only at cortical basal degeneration, it's really much less. Okay. All right. Moving down the list. All right. Oh, I love this one. Now we're going to switch to treatment more directly. What is the value of seeing a movement disorder specialist? Well, first time visit, I'd say about $450. Now, if you're in the Canadian system, <laughs> and people that think they have to wait a long time in Canada, just call my office. <laughs> Canada looks pretty good. That's terrible. That came up at the fashion show. Yes. Okay. So what's the value of seeing a movement disorder specialist? Let me tell you what we know, and then I'll tell you faith, because we're in the right place for that. So what we know, a study published by uh, Allison Willis with Brad Reset, two people here, demonstrated looking at Medicare records, and it was only based on about 455,000 people in the US, so that's some limitation, but they were older people, it wasn't young onset. And it looked at how long people lived, whether they, how long it took before, if they needed to go to a nursing home, or the risk of that, or breaking a hip. And it turned out that people treated by a neurologist for their Parkinson's as opposed to their primary care physician lived one whale of a lot longer and a lot better. Much less risk of going into a nursing home, less risk of falling and breaking a hip. So that we have data for. So is there some value in seeing a movement disorder specialist? Does that really translate? Well, I think it's probably true, but we don't have data for it. But what proximate value is there? Well, movement disorder specialists are far more likely to know about the latest research, the newest medications, whether the new meds medications are worth taking. There are a lot of new medications that have new and improved side effects that may not be necessarily a good thing. So, at, for you in particular, so each person, you know, you're human beings, you're not petri dishes. Everybody's different. So, going to somebody who's really familiar with that has an advantage. There's another advantage. Now, here's my bias. You may get involved in research because your movement disorder specialist may be doing research. Does that matter to you? It sure as heck has the potential to matter to you, and especially to your kids and our next generation. But I would say we've made advances that are helping people today. I mean, medicines that are taking, people are taking now are medicines that were developed in research during our lifetimes, obviously, and not so long ago. So being involved in research is important. And I'll give you another piece of information. If you're in a drug study and it's scientifically controlled, because if you're not in a scientifically controlled drug study, which means you're either taking the real stuff or a fake tablet or something else to compare with, if it's not done that way, it's probably not worth doing because you'll never get an answer that's interpretable at the end. Even those people who get the placebo, the fake tablet, there's evidence to suggest that they do better. And one reason may be, now I'm going to speculate, because when you're in a study, there's a heck of a lot more attention paid to make sure everything's just so-so. And uh, I would strongly encourage everybody to participate in research studies if you're eligible. Not everybody's eligible, but stay out there. We may have something new for you. So that's an advantage of seeing a movement disorder specialist. And if you can see Dr. Martin, then you get a very sweet guy too, and it's also very good. Anything else? Yeah, that's why they do better. All right. 
What would the recommended frequency of appointments a Parkinson's patient should have with a movement disorders doctor? The disease is so variable each day and would seem to need close supervision by a professional, but that doesn't seem to be the case in many situations in Dr. Perlmutter's office. Oh, no, they didn't add that. Okay, so the answer is the frequency of visits depends upon the needs of the individual and their family. And so the general need to be seen, quite frankly, more, com more frequently than they were seen in my office. I'm going to tell you that right now. We were so swamped, I was pretty much seeing people once a year. A disaster. We took a lot of phone calls and we did a lot of care over phone, which is great, but it's not the same. We've actually remedied that, thank goodness. So Barb is here because she replaced Johanna Hartline, who was our research nurse for 15 years. Johanna is a nurse practitioner. I would venture to say Johanna knows more about Parkinson's disease than most neurologists. And, uh, and, as, and as she always says, it's, it's good to have a smart doctor, but more important to have a nice nurse. <laughs> and she now sees patients for us, and she can see people as often as they need to do. And so some people come in every few months, some people a little bit more during times of difficulty, some people every six months, and you know what? Some people once a year is perfectly fine. And that doesn't have to stay the same, it could change depending upon needs. So it's really a very variable depending upon what's going on. And how comfortable, how much you can relate the symptoms over the phone, and how much time your doctor will spend talking to you or the doctor's office will spend talking to you. Do you have a set answer for that? Uh, no. I, How often do you typically see your patients? Well, I have the same problem that you do in that there's more patients than there is time to see them. Um, the usual time is about every nine months. Yeah. Some do fine with 12, some it needs to be six, some it needs to be more often than that. Right. And nurses are really important as well. Right. And, and contact with the nurses when the contact with the physician isn't possible can certainly help a great deal. Right. Now, our system might be a little bit different too uh, in that I'm not the only physician involved with my patients and they all have a family doctor and some of them can be managed fine seeing their family doctor regularly and their uh, movement disorder specialist less frequently and there can be contact between physicians as necessary as well. Right, and most of our patients have an internist or a family doctor as well, um, but we also, um, we stick our nose in a lot of stuff, and if there's a change in medicines, it's probably best to pass a lot of those across our desk one way or the other. Okay. Oh, here's a good one. This is, again, we're sticking with treatment. We talk a lot about neuroprotection. Please explain what this is. We have some inkling, well, let's just stop there. So this is really a key question, neuroprotection. And this is, is not so, it's, it seems like it should be an easy answer, but it really, when you get down to details, it's not. But the idea, neuroprotection, is to either stop the progression of the disease in the brain, reverse it, or slow the progression of the disease in the brain, which should translate into reduced symptoms that the person has or reduction of symptoms. But the key thing about the brain issue is to try to reduce the, what's going on in the brain that's causing the problem, not just relieve the symptoms. So let me try to give you a distinction, and I'll tell you in a minute why that distinction is probably not right. So if we give somebody carbidopa levodopa to help replace the missing dopamine, that helps replace missing dopamine in the brain, but doesn't get at the problem of how come there's not enough nerve cells to produce the dopamine. It may make the symptoms better, so we would call that symptomatic treatment. We wouldn't call that disease modifying in the sense that it's not neuroprotection. So let me tell you why that may be really not right. So people who take L-dopa, son of a gun, live longer. Why isn't that disease modifying? That alters the course of the illness. So it's really how you interpret it. But what the holy grail we're trying to do when we talk about these things is to reverse the process in the brain that leads to these abnormalities in the brain that causes the symptoms. So 
get at what causes the nerve cells to die that causes less dopamine in the brain. If we can do that, that's what we consider uh, neuroprotection, reduce the rate at which they die, or reverse them potentially. Then they follow this up on, there are toxins in the environment that are pretty pervasive. Is my disease progression getting worse due to continued exposure to toxins? Wow, wow. So uh, that's actually, that's not an easy uh, issue. So uh, there was an editorial, I'm just thinking about this now, there was an editorial in one of our journals called Neurology, written by Brad Reset and Allison Willis recently. I've mentioned their names a lot when it comes to this kind of thing. And they were saying, we're spending too much effort doing big drug trials of things that are gonna reduce progression before they're ready to be tested, rather than looking at and avoiding exposures that may contribute to Parkinsonism. Kind of the approach with stroke and uh, heart attack, where the prevention may be more important than the treatment. And uh, so this is a fair question. And there is a lot of work about environmental toxins. It's not clear if environmental toxins exactly cause Parkinson's disease, or they cause, they definitely can cause, some of them can cause Parkinsonism, and they can damage similar parts in the brain. Uh, the best information about looking at genetic contributions say that it's all the different kinds of small little changes in the DNA may in total add up to about 20 or 25 percent of the risk. The converse of that is if that's the genetic contribution, well then the environment must be the 75 percent. We just don't know what in the environment is that, and whether it's a toxin or an infection or something in your gut that gets up through a nerve and gets into your brain, we still don't know that answer. So uh, yeah, if you're, if you're doing something that gives you, uh, if you're exposed to some toxin that affects the brain, you probably should try to reduce that. But you know, it's not the fillings in your teeth. And there are plenty of people who had all the fillings in their teeth taken out because they had silver fillings because they thought there was some uh, mercury in there that was gonna contribute to Parkinson's. That gives you a pain in the mouth that's really not gonna help your Parkinson's. Any thoughts about toxins? I think it's important to remember that it's not a new disease. It's been around for a long, long time. It's not part of modern industrialized society. James Parkinson described it back in the 1800s. It was actually described by Leonardo da Vinci before that. And I believe there's, there's reference to it in ancient Egyptian writings. So it's not a modern industrialized society disease. Okay, here's a tough question. My 51-year-old son will not talk to family members about his PD. How do we respond to that? How does each person respond to an illness or a diagnosis? Boy, that's very, very tough. So I think if you have a family member or a close friend who has a diagnosis and they're not talking about it, you know, people go through different stages when they learn about a new diagnosis. One can be denial that it's really, really me, I don't really believe it, or anger, or, you know, all these kinds of things can go on. And then there may at some point become acceptance. So the best we can do as caregivers and family members and friends is to be there, be ready. I'm not sure it is helpful to push the issue, uh, but I think it's, it's, ready to, it's important to open the door. When you're ready to talk about it, I'm here. I'm here for you. Or let's, if you're interested, we can come to the PEP meeting and learn something about it. Or maybe we can call up uh, Debbie Geyer's office and see if we can get information and let's look at that booklet together to see if there's something we can learn. Maybe exercise would be something you wanna do now and you know, that you'd be interested because you know what? Exercise may be as good a way to slow the disease progression as anything. There's increasing studies looking at that. I mean, this is, certainly can improve well-being for those who like to exercise and those people who prefer to do tango or waltz, maybe even square dancing somebody brought up, but I don't know of a study with square dancing. So how do you respond to that? It's very, it's just a challenge. I think you have to understand what that person's going through and just be supportive and I would 
I would tend not to push it hard, but I would be try to make yourself as available and open as possible. Do you have any other insights? What is the best thing to say to someone who has PD and how to encourage them? You know what? It's a lot better to get PD today than it was 15 or 20 years ago. There's a lot, we have a lot more medicines. We understand a heck of a lot more about it. We're closer to doing something that may modify the disease. There are probably at least six or seven <coughs> avenues of, of research trying to disease for disease modification, slow the disease progression or reverse it in the brain. So, you know, that's a pretty big deal. So we're way better than we were at James Parkinson's time in 1817 or uh, Leonardo da Vinci's time. We're really better. Of course, they probably didn't worry about it as much because they didn't live as long anyway. They died of other things. All right. Treatment. Standard drugs, I divided. Carbidopa levodopa. Is there any ba benefit to taking brand name versus generic? I can tell you we tested about three or four generics compared to brand name Cinemet in our laboratory, and they were spot on. There was no difference. There could be some difference in how they dissolve, and I think people who take generic, I mean, who take brand name are spending extra money. I generally wouldn't do it. Yet, and I tell everybody that, and yet there are a few rare people who say, gosh, it just didn't work for me, and they really believe it. And, you know, I have these big question marks that go in my brain about how could that be, and maybe it dissolves differently and there could be something different. Maybe it's just that they're really invested with that particular drug. I don't know. I don't push brand name. I think generics are perfectly fine. I agree. I think that changing from one brand to another is sometimes an issue, but generally speaking, I agree. And, and the reason that changes is that they can dissolve differently, is, is usually the thought. To make a generic or any drug in this country, and this is important for one of the later questions, the FDA requires the dose to be plus or minus 10%. Doesn't have to be better than that, it has to be within 10%. And most of the time, that kind of difference doesn't make much difference. But it's the same is true whether it's a brand name or generic. Doesn't make a difference in the accuracy of that. But that's going to take me, I'm going to jump to a question. What is your opinion of trying Macuna purians, which is a natural source of L-DOPA to treat Parkinson's? And so I've ha I have actually a bottle of this on my desk. I love it. It's so beautiful. It's, it's, uh... So it has, on average, 40% of it is L-DOPA. And I know there's a doctor in Missouri that sells this from his office and pushes that. Since it's not considered and manufactured as an FDA-regulated drug, but rather as a supplement, there is no guarantee for its purity or percentage. So if you want to take a medicine for which you're not sure how much you're going to get, then take that. But I would consider that foolish. That's pretty direct response. If you, you're going to take the same darn medicine, whether it's you know, from part of a bean or made in the, in the lab, it's still levodopa. It's not different. There's no difference. You get a bunch of extra stuff when you take it as this thing, which you get the pure stuff when you take it from a drug company, and you know what you're getting. Not knowing doesn't make it better. It's far more, there'll be far more variability. It's probably also worth remembering that Makuna doesn't have carbidopa in it. So, right. so it may not be as effective as the uh, drug company supplied product. And more likely to make you throw up. All right, what are the side, or me throw up, hearing about it. What are the side, but I still have it on my desk to remind me of this. What are the side effects from taking carbidopa alone? So carbidopa, you remember, is that component. When, we, when you get carbidopa, levodopa, you're getting two medicines. Levodopa is the business action. That's what gets into the brain and gets converted to dopamine to help replace the missing dopamine. Carbidopa blocks the conversion of L-dopa to dopamine in the rest of the body. And because if you get, take just plain L-dopa, most of that L-dopa will get converted to dopamine in the body, and that will make your blood pressure drop, 
and that will make you sick to your stomach and throw up, or a very high chance of it. And so before carbidopa or benzericide, which is available in Canada, it does the same thing in other places in the world, people would get fairly sick trying to take just all dopa, and you'd have to get a big dose and to get enough into your brain. So carbidopa blocks that. So if you block that, carb if you take just carbidopa alone, will that help? It doesn't get into the brain. It's not likely to make any benefit for you from Parkinson's. It really only helps you if you're taking L-dopa. You don't have much L-dopa in your blood without taking medication. So the carbidopa is not gonna make much difference. What about side effects? I don't know of, I haven't ever seen side effects from carbidopa. It theoretically could happen, but I don't, never seen any. We don't use it. It's not available in Canada, so I can't so answer that. So back in the old days when there wasn't generic carbidopa levodopa, just Cinemet, made by Merck, Merck would provide us with free carbidopa if somebody needed extra. Free. We could just call them up and they'd send it and then I could give it to the patient and they would need to take it if they were having nausea from their carbidopa levodopa because in the standard formulation, there, for some people, there's not enough carbidopa. Now the carbidopa alone costs more than carbidopa levodopa. Uh, I guess that's because it's generic. So I don't think it's a big deal, but I don't see any particular value in it. All right, here's an interesting one. Any tips for avoiding nausea when taking PD meds? So usually carbidopa, so I'm talking about carbidopa levodopa, but I'll talk about the others here in a second. So usually with carbidopa levodopa, I will recommend when first starting it, taking it about 30 minutes or so, at least 30 minutes before a meal. And the reason for that is it may get into your blood and into your brain a little bit better. It's not critical for most people. Some people where they're more severe are very sensitive to food effects. It turns out in protein, there's a certain kind of amino acid that can interfere with the L-dopa getting into your brain. But for most people, it's not a big deal. So if somebody has nausea with it, the first thing I do is just take it with some food. And if you need to take a little more, that's okay. The next thing, some people though get really substantial nausea from it, then we give supplemental carbidopa. And if that doesn't work, then we have some other choices. One choice that's available in Canada that we don't have here is domperidone. That can block the nausea uh, substantially and that can be very effective. What about the other PD meds? So there's pramipexol, ropinerol. Those things also can cause nausea. In fact, they're, they more commonly cause nausea, I would say, than uh, even levodopa. So again, taking with meals may help to some degree. Adjusting which medicines you're taking. So if you're taking only those, you may do better with a different medicine. So altering that. Uh, sometimes there are medicines that can slow the emptying of the stomach that can cause some upset, usually more bloating than nausea. Uh, and that's things like amantadine sometimes can do that, but old style anticholinergics, you know, cogentin, artane, those things can make it worse. Hopefully not a lot of people are taking that today, although I shouldn't address your individual medicines. Do uh, you have other thoughts about that? No, uh, just to say that uh, domperidone, which we have in Canada, is extremely effective for the nausea from not only from levodopa, carbidopa, but also from the, all of the dopamine agonists. Right. Any drug that acts on dopamine receptors, domperidone can, is very effective at dealing with side effects. So this medicine is made by Janssen, a pharmaceutical company. I think they still make it. And when I was in England in 82 or 83, I prescribed it a lot. And uh, we don't have it in this country. And uh, so a number of my patients and from our group we will uh, direct them how to obtain it from Canada. Although you didn't hear that from me. <laughs> so that can be good. There are some other choices. Dancitron can sometimes help, but it's not really hitting directly what we want. And so frequently it doesn't do the job. But what you don't want to take is metoclopramide or Reglan or Compazine because those things can make Parkinson's much more severe and a big problem. They work kind of like Domperidone, but the difference is those get into the brain and block the dopamine action, whereas domperidone doesn't get into the brain nearly as, in the same way. And so it's a big difference. Okay. Did you want to add? That was good. All right. Um, why does a person have to take pramipexal or carbidopa levodopa? Oh, take both. 
How long after diagnosing does a person get worse? I have cognitive impairment. I don't understand how that affects my thinking on every level. Could you explain? So, sometimes people take both kinds of medicines, pramipaxol and carbidopa, levodopa. Parkinson's can progress. We talked about that already. If somebody's having cognitive problems, and that is trouble looking up a phone number and dialing a phone or being able to do the bills or remembering things or getting disoriented, those kinds of problems can be made worse by medication. And so it's very important to try to reduce or eliminate any medicines that can make that worse. And if the Parkinson's, you need to treat the movement problem, the motor symptoms to not fall down, then under those circumstances, carbidopa, levodopa, and medicines that make that last longer or affect that are probably reasonable. The dopamine agonists, which are pramipexol, ropinerol, the patch, rotigotine, the injectable apomorphine, they may make the thinking problems. They're more likely to exacerbate the thinking problems. So if it's possible to get off, to reduce or eliminate those, it would be better. But just to be fair, L-dopa also can cause thinking problems in some people. So again, if thinking problems occur, try to reduce or eliminate medicines that can be making that worse. That's really important, and you need to review that. And make sure it's not something else causing thinking problems, because that's not the only reason. Make sure it's not a vitamin deficiency or something else is going on, or a bladder infection that's just making everything much worse at the time. All right, here's another question. I was diagnosed a year and a half ago and have not yet started on any drugs other than tremors. What symptoms might taking Parkinson's uh, drugs help? Can I just wait? I think Dr. Martin answered that. You don't need to take medicine unless you feel like you want to have improvement of your symptoms. If your symptoms aren't bothering you, they're not interfering with your function, you're still going out and do stuff, you don't need to take medicine. You don't have to take medicine because your significant other is complaining of your shaking, only if that's shaking bothering you. In that case, we just need to educate your significant other, okay? So, on the other hand, sometimes your significant other can notice problems that you're having that you may not be so in tune with, so sometimes you need to work together. But again, you take medicine when you need it. Other than tremors, so, and this relates to another question that was, I must have missed somewhere, but L-DOPA can help all the manifestations of Parkinson's. Some people are concerned that it won't help the balance problems, but I can tell you when we did the old L-DOPA study, one of the first things that got better when people lost their balance is their balance got better. But when it gets more severe, it may not be as effective. But the bottom line is it can help all of those things. Um, so, and it can help tremor too. One person said, well, L-DOPA doesn't help tremor. What else should I take? Well, L-DOPA can help tremor. There are some people that L-DOPA doesn't help their tremor. That occasionally does happen. So there are other choices for that, including deep brain stimulation. But we'll come more to deep brain stimulation in a bit. We're really, we got I've got, got some more here for you. Oh, I got, I got, uh, I I'm not even uh, halfway here. Talk fast. All right, talk fast. If you uh, need to use the restrooms, you can. I can or they can? You got a little bottle up here for there me. You are, yeah. oh. <laughs> All right. I'm an, I'm an 81 year old male diagnosed with Parkinson's in January 2015. My only symptom is tremor in my right arm and leg. I play golf three times a week and walk on the treadmill three, time, three days a week. I was started on half a tablet of carbidopa levodopa initially three times a day and now up to three tablets three times a day. My tremor is better. Can I stop taking the medicine now? <laughs> you just answered the question. No. It doesn't cure the disease, it's treating the symptoms. If you stop the medicine suddenly, first of all, you can be in big danger. Do you need that much? I don't know how much you need, but if that's the dose that you had to get to to control your symptoms, then keep taking it unless you have side effects that are a problem. So it's everybody's dose is determined by two things, benefit versus side effects. That would be the only two things if we were in Canada. Since we're in the U.S., the third thing is cost, okay? And that is an issue for some people. So, but theoretically, benefit versus side effects. If you're doing well, it's doing the job, I always say to people, 
Take the dose that works, not less than that, but not more than that. Just get what works for you. And that may require some adjustment. Okay. My wife has PD for several years and been prescribed carbidopa, levodopa three times a day. I'm puzzled by how unpredictable on and off, on means medicine's working, off is worn off, how they can be and how frequently they switch. One moment she's on, the next moment she's off. There's great variability. So the question is, how come? That's really what's coming on here. And sometimes when she's having a problem, she can get an adrenaline burst and go zoop. That's actually an old story, but we'll come to that in a second. So the answer is, as Parkinson's gets more severe, there's less ability in the brain to store dopamine. If we give people all dopa and they get the dopamine in the brain, sometimes it gets in the little vesicles, as our Canadian northern uh, partner would say, or vesicles, as I would say, but it means little packages of dopamine in the remaining nerve cells. But, you know, as time goes on, there are fewer remaining nerve cells. We think this is the mechanism. We're not 100% sure. So then, the effect in the brain may depend more closely uh, aligned with what the blood level is. And when you take a tablet of L-dopa, carbidopa, levodopa, actually it gets in and goes out pretty quickly. It's half-life, which means how fast it goes down to half the peak level, is really 60 to 90 minutes. So it goes, you know, like that. And people can vary even more because there are other factors that affect your response other than just the blood level in those circumstances. And if one's taking it frequently or just skirting the level that gives them benefit, then they can have little fluctuations and bounce on and off. And there's all kinds of things that affect absorption. For example, having a big meal. Having a big meal puts a lot of blood, puts a lot of food in there, protein there can interfere in some cases. Activity and exercise may use up some dopamine and have an effect. So there are a lot of factors and probably a lot of factors we don't know about that can cause these fluctuations, but you need to go through that. Um, can an adrenaline burst override the symptoms? Well, we do know that there's something called paradoxical kinesia, and that is somebody can be slow and stuck and off with their Parkinson's sitting there shaking, unable to get up out of the chair, and somebody yells, and this is fake, this is not true, yells fire in a room. There is no fire here today, just to keep you calm. And that person can jump up and run out. And you know what? That's just not psychological in any way that we know about, because I can tell you I saw that with one of my furry friends. So I had, many years ago, I did research with monkeys for Parkinson's, and I had one monkey that we made very severely Parkinson's, and I was feeding that animal in the room with them back in the days when we were able to do that. Now the restrictions are much greater. And a stranger walked into the room. The animal looked up, bolted to the corner, and froze again. So even monkeys can get paradoxical kinesi uh, kinesia. So it's really kind of interesting. I should have written that one up. It was kind of an interesting observation. All right. And whether that's an adrenaline burst or what's causing that, I think we don't know the answer, unless you know the answer. Okay. I am taking carbidopa levodopa three times a day. That's a familiar sound, isn't it? I notice that if I'm, taking, if I'm late in taking the midday dose, I actually feel more alert and energized than when I take the meds. So let me just address that. So in some people, dopa or other medicines, even more likely the other medicines, but dopa definitely can induce sleepiness or lethargy. And if we eliminate all the medicines that are even worse doing that, and you need the amount of dopa that you're taking, you still have too much lethargy, then what do we do? And we want to make sure it's not a drop in blood pressure, because that's a different way. And that can be one way dopa can cause lethargy as blood pressure drops. So you have to make the diagnosis properly and be careful. Then sometimes we even give people caffeine, have them take uh, caffeine in the morning several cups of good strong coffee or go to the drugstore and buy a no-dose. But again, it's a trade-off. Make sure that that's appropriate for that person and they're not having side effects. But there are different strategies for that. All right. All right. What might the worst case scenario implications be for a Parkinson's patient who must have a surgical procedure under anesthesia? This is a very common scenario that we have to address. So we're not, I'm not 
I'm not talking about surgery for Parkinson's, just another operation, whether it's prostate or a lumpectomy or whatever the heck it is going to be. And the answer is there's substantial issues here. So it's common after anesthesia for people to be nauseated and people to get anti-nausea medicine. So it's very important they don't get one that makes their Parkinson's much worse, like compazine, perchlorphenazine, those kinds of things. So a Dancitron is okay. So there's very specific things. In addition, it's common after surgery for people to get pain medicines or sleeping medicines. And if somebody already has any kind of problem with their thinking with Parkinson's, those drugs can make things much worse. In fact, even diphenhydramine, Benadryl, commonly thought to be safe and wonderful, can be a major problem for people with Parkinson's. They can get, start hallucinating, seeing things that aren't there, frightened for a week or two after a couple of doses of that. So when one of our people are going for surgery, we usually we have a standard list of medicines to avoid we give them, and frequently we will even talk to their anesthesiologist or their doctor and explain what to watch for and, and uh, things to avoid. But it's definitely an issue that needs to be addressed in a major way. All right, now I'm going to go to DBS questions. Can DBS completely eradicate the need for Cinemet or carbidopa, levodopa? The answer is, can it? In some cases it could, but we try not to do that. And the reason we try not to do that is DBS is also a treatment therapy, and it's a dose-related phenomena. So what we generally do is we aim for about half the dose, but again, it depends on the individual. And the reason I say that is, if we're jump increasing the voltage on the DBS, then you're going to burn the battery out faster and you need to replace it faster. So it might be better to give enough DBS current to make the symptoms smooth, permit us to reduce the medicine to get rid of some medicine side effects, but not altogether. Because the higher the voltage, the quicker you burn out that battery, you need to come in, go to sleep, and get a new uh, pulse generator battery pack installed, which for the drug company will get a ton of money for that, but you'd prefer to have as few of those as needed. So we don't necessarily push it to its maximum. That's not, that's not the goal. Okay, speak about the general qualifications for DBS. So there's some controversy on this, and I'll give you my uh, bias. My bias is, first of all, you need to have what we best think is regular Parkinson's disease, what we call idiopathic Parkinson's disease. If your doctor's not sure, you shouldn't be going to DBS. And, uh, and remember, when we think we're sure, we're not always right. But, so the best information should be that. That generally means good response to levodopa. Now, some people can't tolerate enough levodopa to test that, so, and, but that's the rare case. Usually somebody should have a good response, but the problems come from doesn't last long enough and taking more medicine would cause unacceptable side effects, whether it's too much dyskinesia or drop in blood pressure or seeing things that aren't there. Those are bad choices. So my standard glib statement is if tablets work, don't put two holes in your head, okay? So if medicine's working. Now there are other people, other Parkinson specialists who would push and promote DBS at an earlier stage, thinking that it'll slow disease progression. When I look at their data, their data shows very clearly it doesn't do that at all. However, the point is fair in that there's also no point in waiting way beyond and having people suffer when DBS could provide some excellent benefit if adjustment of medicine is not doing the job. So again, the diagnosis must be correct. DOPA almost always should have a good benefit, and a couple of exceptions are Mark Tremor. Sometimes doesn't respond, and DBS can do a great job for that. But there'll be other manifestations of PD almost always in those cases that are demonstrating response. The other third thing is, generally we tend not to do this in people who already have substantial thinking problems, because DBS does not help that, if anything, can make that worse. And the potential side effects with DBS can be more likely in people who have difficulty with their thinking. So that's the other thing. DBS surgery is not without risks as well, remember? You put a needle wire deep down in the brain, if it hits a blood vessel, it can cause bleeding in the brain and you can die. 
You can have a stroke, paralyzed on one side, lose your language, lose your speech, all kinds of things, get an infection in your brain, develop seizures, get blood clots. Am I making it sound really fun? The risk here for those things is less than 1%. But guess what? If you're that person, that's too high. So if tablets do it, don't do it. But if you're substantially impaired, you have regular Parkinson's, you're limited in the dose you can take, this could be a great option for you. Uh, is research to the point that one could stand up in a courtroom and say for certain, certain that welding had a direct link for causing Parkinson's disease? How sure are you at the, so I just addressed this directly. The research is at the point where we think that welding and manganese toxicity affects the brain. I think the data are pretty good for that. There's no question about that. I think it affects the part of the brain that's also affected by Parkinson's in the general area. Whether it exactly causes Parkinson's disease or not, I would say there is not convincing data of that at this time. In fact, some of the changes we see in the brain, and this is uh, Brad Reset and Susan Criswell have done this research, suggest that it's actually a little different pattern that's affected in the part of the brain where the dopamine is uh, produced and used. A little different pattern from standard Parkinson's disease. Yet people who weld have a higher risk of Parkinsonian features, but not necessarily Parkinson's disease. So I would think uh, we are not standing up in court and saying it's causing Parkinson's disease. All right? And what do I know about those studies? A fair amount. Okay, can I comment on the new non-invasive non -invasive MRI guided focused ultrasound treatment for the globus pallidus instead of implanted microelectrodes to treat motor symptoms of tremor rigid to treat Parkinson's. We have a physician friend who is very excited about this. So uh, that's an interesting procedure that's a, a research procedure right now and is being done a number of places in the world, including Canada. Uh, it's basically the same thing as doing a pallidotomy for Parkinson's. In fact, it is the same thing as doing a pallidotomy. So putting a lesion in that one specific part of the brain. The difference between the ordinary pallidotomy and this procedure is that it's completely non-invasive. So you don't have a hole drilled in your skull. You don't have any, any, um, uh, any implanted anything. Completely non-invasive. So if the targeting is accurate enough to produce a lesion in that part of the brain that's in exactly the right place and not one or two millimeters off, then it's going to be every bit as beneficial as a, as a pallidotomy. I don't think we're there yet. I think that the research has to be done. It has been done with essential tremor using a related procedure, and it does look to be very effective for that. So I think we're going to see more of it. But the key thing is it's making a hole in that part of the brain. That's what a lesion means. It makes a hole. And the reason we stop doing that for essential tremor is if you need to do it on both sides of the brain for both sides, then people have substantial difficulty with talking. And with DBS, you can adjust it. However, a lot of people only with essential tremor only need one side done. And for them, it would be perfectly acceptable. Pallidotomies are making a hole in this part of the brain. We did years ago. But again, it can help reduce the dyskinesias that occur with DOPA but it doesn't permit us to reduce the dose of L-DOPA. So if L-DOPA is having dose-limiting side effects other than dyskinesias, it's not an effective approach. But there are other reasons to go one target versus another. But it is a new option, and it is a, a cool way of making a hole in parts of the brain where you want to make a hole, and that's good. So it's a hole in the brain, but not in the skull. Right, right. That's a big advantage. All right, now to get to the other side, what about... Uh, dopa gel, or some people call it DWAPA, <laughs> whatever that is. But that, so this is the new approach, which is a cool thing. They c people can make, we can make a hole right through your belly and put a tube down in through your stomach into the small intestine and hook you up with a pump that uh, infuses constantly a concentrated form of DOPA that's in a gel. 
and the trick with this, and that can help make people much smoother in their response to medicine. So wow, that sounds better than DBS initially. Here's the pros and the cons. First of all, the pump is a procedure that's common to have lots of annoying side effects from that initial procedure. So you can get irritation around where it goes. It requires addressing it and keeping it clean on a daily basis. It requires somebody who is thinking clearly, because if you're not thinking clearly and you wake up in the night, you rip that tube out, that can be a problem. And so it's not an end-all or be-all, but it is a reasonable option for some. The total dose of DOPA used to get people under control is usually what they've been taking or even a little bit higher. So it's not a way of being able to lower the dose. But it does give us a non-brain surgical option for some people that can tolerate this and can manipulate that. This person was concerned because they needed to use a bunch of extra or more cartridges. If somebody's on a fairly high dose of levodopa, this may not be a great choice for them because they may need to use a heck of a lot of cartridges and it could be a very expensive uh, approach. But that's not usually the limiting factor for people. So again, the side effects are usually much more pronounced up front. They're not usually dangerous, they're just kind of annoying, but you need to get through that and then it takes some adjustment. So it's not real easy, but it's not real hard either. But there's stuff to maintain and take care of in the long term. And it's, oh, here's a good one. Describe the nasal spray for quick recovery. So this made us together go to the internet to find nasal sprays. I can tell you we found five different nasal sprays. Uh, oh, and I'm going to add a sixth because it wasn't in the list. That's my favorite. So uh, the his first nasal spray is, it turns out in Parkinson's, it's very common to get nasal drip. So uh, nasal spray to reduce the nasal drip doesn't help your walking any. And uh, that's like Atrovent and stuff like that. Just have to be careful because that can get into the brain and make people have problems with their thinking or cause hallucinations, see things that aren't there. Not too terrible, but not Terrible if it occurs, but it, it can occur. Then there is a way of injecting through the nose a chemical called GDNF. And what that is, that's a growth factor to help nerve cells grow. And it's thought if we put this GDNF into the part of the brain where the nerve cells are dying, maybe we can help them to regrow. And there's some animal data suggesting that. So how do you get it into the brain? There was a big study where people put in tubes down into the part of the brain we call the ventricle, which is a fluid-filled sac, and tried to infuse it that way. And it really didn't work because the GDNF never got to the target in the brain. It didn't diffuse. It didn't travel far enough in the brain to get where it needed to go. But the idea is to put these in nanoparticles. Nanoparticles are tiny little kind of carriers that they can put the GDNF in there, or the, the DNA that makes the GDNF, put, shoot that up in the nose and it can penetrate and get up into the brain, or at least that's the idea. So it worked in rats. That's how far we are, okay? So it's not ready for prime time. And what works in a rat may or may not work in a human because the distances the things have to go is really substantially different. That's what screwed up the previous study that was actually done in monkeys and trying to go to humans. It really, the distance has made a difference, so that didn't work. Roticotine, there's a formulation of that. That's the, what's used in the patch to see if it can be absorbed through nasal uh, infusion or spray. So that's being looked at. There's inhaled dopa. And I think that's probably what this person was going after. It's called CVT-301. And so there is a very, there has been a small study, what we call a phase two study, showing it's safe. And a phase three study, which is a big study now, at 60 centers did we find? That we may even be doing it here, I don't even remember, um, where it's being tested. So that's a big study, and that we just started at the end of 2014. And so we, don't, we won't know the results of that until that study is completed. But that has potential. So that may be a way of getting 
dope it in faster into the blood and then into the brain. That's the whole goal behind it. The other way to re uh, recover somebody is, you know, give a shot of apomorphine. That's another one of these dopamine agonists that may be a little bit faster than, uh, than dope, but it's really much faster at making people throw up, too. One of the best around for that. Uh, then there is intranasal glutathione, which is a, uh, another drug that has to do with um, uh, what we call free radicals that may contribute to some of the death of nerve cells in the brain, and that's being tested. They're injecting through the nose is safe, and that's being funded just starting this year, funded by Michael J. Fox looking at it. Then the other one I will mention because and that's the uh, stromal vascular fraction, and that's attempting to extract stem cells from brown fat that one can take out of people, and you can go to several centers in this country and get that done. There was an article in the New England Journal of Medicine this past summer uh, uh, saying how the data for doing that was not adequate, and they were very concerned about this being done in this country. New treatments. How do researchers induce PD in laboratory animals for studying the disease? Many different ways. So there are different animal models of Parkinson's, and the one model that might be the most true to Parkinson's from some sense is to take what's found in people, and that is some people who have the rare genetic defect, taking that genetic defect and injecting that in a way into a mouse and that's a mouse model. We call that a transgenic model of Parkinson's. It's a way of determining some biochemical type changes and studying that. That mouse model doesn't develop anything that looks like Parkinson's disease, so it's, it doesn't exactly translate. There are other approaches to destroy the brain cells that make dopamine, because that's one thing that occurs in Parkinson's disease. That can be done in rodents by injecting a toxin directly into the brain that destroys those. It can be done in rodents or higher animals like monkeys by injecting it through a blood vessel that goes to the brain and delivering a toxin directly that can kill a various, varial, variable number of these nerve cells. You can even inject that uh, with just a regular shot and, and have it affect both sides. But when we do just one side, it only affects one side of the animal's brain and the other side is, gets Parkinson's, but the other side's good, so they're only affected with Parkinson's, Parkinson's-like symptoms. And that's a great way of testing new drugs uh, for treating symptoms. So there are a whole bunch of different animal models. People are trying to get genetic models in monkeys. And the reason for monkeys, because these are very valuable animals that you know have some intellect, and we take them extremely seriously, is their behavior very closely mimics the behavior in people. And so it's a huge advantage for everybody in this room that they're able to get treatment. That's my daughter, I'll, I'll catch her later. <laughs> She's a therapist in Boston, uh, occupational therapist. So if you hear me recommending OT, I'm biased. All right. So. Uh, that, that's basically the different kinds of models. There are a whole host of different toxins people do that uh, test these things. Do you have any other thoughts on that? Okay. I, we do that a lot. Okay. I've heard. So I don't know what to do with this. I've heard that there is a new medicine approved for people with PD in Canada, which is, uh, but not in the U.S. Could you tell us more about it? So that's why we had to fly in Wayne Martin to talk about this issue. And the two of us found, what, what were the two we knew? I've been thinking about this for the last 24 hours, and I don't know of a new medicine that's been approved. In but the old ones? Well, the old one, Domperidone, which we've had for 25 years. 30 years. Yeah. OK. All right. So now I've got to go to this nilotimib, or nilotitib. Say it. How, how do you say it? N-I-L-O-T-I-N-I-B. Nilotinib. Nilotinib. The cancer drug, the leukemia drug, this is the big splash. This makes me crazy, okay? But I'm gonna tell you what's known. So it's an FDA-approved drug for leukemia. There was a Society of Neuroscience meeting a few weeks ago, which I was at, 
And at the Society of Neuroscience, people give talks and presentations. Anybody can send in stuff and give a talk and presentation. They're not what we call peer reviewed. They just, they're accepted because we want to encourage young students and trainees and people to present new ideas, which this is. And this data that was presented was a study, and I use that term loosely, in 12 people, no, 12 people with Parkinson's, no controls, so it's not a scientifically controlled study, no comparison to anything else, just getting this drug, and the people showed improve, and they took this drug for six months. They took two different doses of it, which are substantially less than the doses used for leukemia, so it would be less risky. And they did it in people with PD and PD with cognitive impairment, with dementia, whether it started early or late. And they found, they measured in the spinal fluid, people got spinal taps like they do in our study, they some reduction in the proteins that we think are of concern. And they said, one person could walk that couldn't walk, and three people could talk that couldn't talk. And uh, you don't walk the walker without doing the real study. So is this interesting? Yeah, absolutely interesting. Is it a scientific study? Absolutely not. Do we know if this is going to pan out when we do this properly? No clue. We do know the drug costs about $100 a day. We do know that when you use it for leukemia, you give it for a short time. If this worked in Parkinson's, you give it all the time the rest of the lives. So that's, but the cost, that's maybe something that would be affected if it was ramped up. But there are many, many drugs that have this kind of uncontrolled effect that we just don't know. So there needs to be more research. Is this enough to do more research? Absolutely. Is it enough to get into a study for humans? Absolutely not for a big study. We're not ready for a big study with this. They can do more studies in humans, but they need to do it in a scientifically controlled way. Are we going to do it here next week? No way. We got a lot of other things that, are, that have a lot more data and evidence behind them than just 12 people. Okay? They did rodent studies, to be fair. There were rodent studies done before this, so th and that's good. It just needs more work. This was an amazing splash in the, in the uh, media, way out of proportion compared to other stuff that's going on in Parkinson's disease. This is not what I would call the hottest thing on the planet here for Parkinson's, not even close. There are a lot more promising things. That was done at Georgetown University, just to give them their hope. Okay. Any more comments about that? I think I got that. All right, now, here's a great one. I read in the Wall Street Journal, that's that medical journal, you know, out of New York, <laughs> that referred to a drug M13 manufactured in Cambridge by Neurophage. I would like to know if you can tell me anything about it. It seemed to be completely innovative, according to the article. Are there any clinical trials? Bless you, you taught me something. I knew nothing about this one. Dr. Martin knew nothing about this one. And so here's what we found. So it is a, uh, it's really cool. It's a bacteriophage, this is kind of a virus type thing that can target abnormal protein called amyloid. That's the A-beta that's found in Alzheimer's. And they think it might be able to target other proteins potentially even alpha-synuclein. And so the Michael J. Fox is now starting to, it has been uh, supporting studies in rodents. So if you're a small creature and you want to volunteer for the study, this is an early, early stage. We don't know what else this might do or what things it may affect. It's really cool. I have to say it's really cool. But it's, this is a long way off. But it's another avenue. And I, I don't downplay it. I just, it's not ready. Yet. There are a lot of cool things that's not it. Please update us on the uh, phase two trial of inosine, which is urate. So the phase two trial, so inosine is a um, drug that has to do with uh, metabolism in the brain that is some study suggested people who have high urate levels in their blood would have a lower risk of Parkinson's. And then in some animal models, it suggested that 
building up the urate level in the blood could help reduce uh, some damage in the brain in animals. And of course, you should know that high urate levels is what causes gout. So this is not, you got to be careful here. You don't want to cause gout. So there was a phase two study that was funded, showed the safety of what they had done, which is a big deal because that, uh, going too high is gout, uh, of giving inosine, which raises the, the, uh, the uric acid level. And a phase three study was just funded by NIH. And this is done by my friend Michael Schwartzschild at, uh, at uh, the Harvard School. And with, uh, there's a big, it's going to be a big multi-center trial, and they're moving that forward. Uh, and that'll be two years with a washout, so they'll, you either get the real thing or a, a fake thing. This is a very reasonable thing to do, so we'll see whether this pans out. But don't go out and take this on your own because this is something that has to be done very carefully and under very uh, careful monitoring. So the question was about phase two. Phase two is actually done, and now we're on to phase three with that. Please address SYN120, SYN, S-Y-N, 120, which may help to mention psychosis. And it's currently in a phase two trial called Synapse. We're actually doing that study as part of a multicenter bunch of places are doing that. And so this is a drug that blocks certain chemicals in the brain that may help hallucinations, may help control hallucinations. This has potential. So this is a, a big Parkinson's study group study. Parkinson's study group is a group of investigators together. You're a Parkinson's study group member. I'm a Parkinson's study group member. And it's been going on. There's now over 120 investigators around North America and actually in other places as well. So this is a drug that can be given by mouth and it blocks a chemical, a certain kind of receptor for serotonin. And there's some evidence that it might help some of the thinking problems, which would be amazing because we really don't have anything good. So this is ongoing. We don't know the results at this point. But this is, we expect results by the end of 2016. At least that's when the study should end. So stay tuned. This is pretty interesting. Good, interesting thing. Alternative therapies. Are we done? How long do you want me to go? I'm gone over two hours. Some of you people are still here. I'll keep going. We have 50 more over here, You have 50 more? Okay. Quicker. Let me just sum up. Can exercise delay? There's a whole bunch of things about exercise, whether it's biking, etc. There is increasing data about exercise. When done carefully, it has low risk. Be careful. The data is it absolutely improves quality of life. There are data now showing it can affect your Parkinson's rating scores. Some suggestive data still be, remains to be true, whether it can actually slow disease progression. And most of the uh, studies had been like dance done by Gammon Earhart here and others around uh, the country now, uh, looking at Argentinian tango. But now there's, in addition to that and stretching, there's uh, looking at strength training and to see if that can make a bigger difference. And a whole bunch of people are doing research in this. So I think it's good. I think exercise as much as you can. Don't hurt yourself. Don't be excessive. I'm not a very good person to make that recommendation. I ran 10 miles on an arthritic hip yesterday morning. So, and I do it every week. So, uh, so I have some, poor judgment in this regard. Uh, but uh, somebody was thinking about getting a gym membership for Christmas. Do I think it's a good idea? Absolutely. Whether you have Parkinson's or not, do it. All right. And there's good data about programs like the LSVT big program. And so that's the, uh, you know, think big, speak loudly. Lots of data showing that stuff can help speaking, can help walking, it takes a lot of practice, it takes ongoing practice but good data on those kinds of studies. So that's all good. And is there any place in St. Louis offering the new rock steady boxing and other exercise? Do you know? Not in St. Louis that I'm aware of. We've had a couple offers. Uh, it's, it's out of Indianapolis. Um, we did look up to see how many studies were done. There aren't a lot of studies proving the efficacy, but it's just like any other high energy exercise program. Sounds great, but just don't hit the other person in the head. They don't have contact in the exercise. So what's my opinion about acupuncture, melatonin, and baclofen for people with PD? Do I approve of complementary medications? Oh, acupuncture. I don't know of any 
study proving that that helps in Parkinson's disease. Melatonin, I don't have any downside with it if you want to try it for pain. It can be great for pain. I have no problem and sleep. with pain. And sleep? Tell me about that. Uh, it's good for sleep. That's cool. So I didn't, I didn't know that actually. That's very Melatonin. interesting. Me, uh, no, acupuncture. Oh, acupuncture. Melatonin. Oh, you were talking about melatonin. Oh, I thought you were telling me something new about acupuncture. We use melatonin all the time. Works about half the time. For those people that does work, it's great because it's very low side effect profile. Uh, baclofen, we do occasionally use that for people with bad cramps. I prefer to adjust the carbidopa levodopa if there's any way we can get away with it. But on occasion, baclofen may have a role. Not a very uh, heavy thing. Autopsy brains of Parkinson's said to be heavily laxidized. Really? That's uh, cool. Do you have any recommendations for taking non-prescription antioxidants or free radical scavengers to alleviate this condition? So can we do something to prevent the uh, free radical damage and oxidation that goes on in the brain with Parkinson's? That's what we're doing research on. Some crazy people just take ibuprofen anyway to prevent these things, uh, Dr. Martin. But you know what? There's really, we don't have any good data right now. So we're doing big studies on this thing, this drug carboxyfullerene that is probably the most potent free radical scavenger known. And there's a lot of work, hold tight, don't take anything until we have good studies. That's my opinion. Food and diet. Oh, casomorphines in cheese, because it can interact with uh, dopamine receptors. So this is a very cool thing. Casomorphines are some of the proteins in cheeses that are converted into opiate-like drugs. Opiates are things like uh, heroin. That's a bad one. Uh, morphine, uh, codeine-type drugs. So it turns out those type drugs in very small amounts do interact and they, uh, with dopamine receptors and the same kind of neurons. And so there can be an interaction with there. Uh, whether those things help Parkinson's symptoms directly or not, I, I don't know. I'm sure they'll help the pain, but I'm not aware of using them to treat typical Parkinsonian symptoms. Okay. Moving on. Combining. So foods, can foods interfere? I've already mentioned briefly that in protein, there are large neutral amino acids, part of proteins that may interfere with dopamine getting in. They don't really do anything else that's relevant there. All right. Some promoters leaky gut syndrome. It's not so Nutraceuticals, substances may consider food or part of food intended to prevent or treat or prevent disease. Are these supplements effective for PD? Are they safe? If you want to take a drug, take the real drug. So I'm, I'm not a real fan of this helping specifically with Parkinson's disease. So there's a bunch of uh, specific examples given. Coenzyme Q, 10. So Real cool idea, good rational behavior. We've done the big study. We've proven it doesn't work. Same thing for vitamin E. We've proven it doesn't work. There was a great idea. It was a big study. Didn't work. Creatine also has been in trial. Didn't work. Uh, glutathione has not yet been demonstrated to work, but I think not a big trial that I'm aware of for that. Uh, caffeine, we use resveratrol, so drink red wine. Uh, Kukerman, Kokeman, not a lot of data on these other things. Things that have a combination of a bunch of stuff in it makes it harder to sort out because you really want to identify what is the specific uh, chemical and then go after that because then you can avoid f side effects. And are there dietitians on staff who can help? Yes. That's the answer. Uh, what have you found are the best things to fight off progression? Diet, exercise, medications. Uh, Right now, that's what we're still looking for. Exercise, have a healthy diet, don't get uh, too high of cholesterol, it's probably as good as anything. Medications, we don't, actually, you know, there's one medication that slowed disease progression more than any other, but it was only in a nine month study, and that was L DOPA, actually. So, th probably the best, the greatest effect in slowing disease progression was from L DOPA itself, interestingly enough. But, the study was limited because it was only nine months long, and they only washed out the L-DOPA for one week, two weeks in some people to get rid of the symptomatic effects because otherwise it can be confusing. All right, share the latest research. So indicators for PD-related memory and thinking problems via MRI. So there's a lot of different research going on. 
One of the studies that we're doing is sorting out the different causes of thinking problems, identifying markers, what may predict thinking problems, what's going on in the brain, trying to identify different chemical changes in the brains that we didn't really target before. These may be new targets for treatment. There is a drug that we've developed that looks like it might, has potential to reverse the damage in the brain, but so far it's animal studies only, and we're now we hadn't moved at all on that for a year and a half because we had no funding to do that. And we may have funding coming up shortly. To uh, What I want to do before doing a big study in humans is develop a means for determining how it's working <coughs> in humans, uh, a way of scanning to see that the drug actually gets into the brain and hits the target we think it is. Rather than just spending $15 million on a study, I want to know that I'm hitting the target that I'm aiming so we can really test it. Too many studies, in my opinion, have been done without that really strong evidence that we know we're hitting our targets. And that can be a big waste. There are other people that are looking at vaccines we've talked about and some cool studies, vaccines to try to attack this alpha-synuclein protein. It's not clear that attacking the protein will necessarily make you better. We don't know that. But it's a reasonable place to go after. And so the studies have now shown some of the safety of that approach, and that's a big step. Preliminarily, maybe there was some benefit, but that was not really designed to address that. But that is an avenue for investigation. It's way cool. So that, that's another uh, good thing. People are looking at how does alpha-synuclein spread in the brain? And if they do that, could there be certain spots when it jumps from one nerve cell to the other? Could we block those spots where it, how it gets into the nerve cells? People are starting to even look at that in a dish, even before animal models. So that, there's another down the road that could be way cool if the spread of alpha synuclein is a critical thing, and it very well may be. So that's cool. So there's a lot of stuff with that. And that's called the prion hypothesis because it spreads like this other stuff. There's a lot of work being de uh, on developing new tools for diagnosis and imaging markers and other markers, including having a woman smell you or your T-shirt. Uh, and that's important because if we could diagnose for certain, right now, our only way to know for certain if somebody has Parkinson's is to look at their brain under a microscope. There is no other way. Dr. Martin pointed that out. And we can get a pretty good idea. We think it increases the longer we see somebody, our accuracy, but you know, it's not perfect. And that makes a difference because if we want to test new things or try new things, you got to know what the heck you're treating. You know? And what research is being done to address non-motor symptoms, especially fatigue and apathy? And there actually have been a couple of drugs going after apathy. Uh, fatigue is, can be a tough thing because there can be multiple causes of fatigue. And non-motor symptoms are a big issue right now. So one of the biggest things is to understand what causes it so we can target them better. But things like constipation, there's been a lot of uh, people looking at that, swallowing problems. Um, Thinking problems is really the, by far the biggest unmet need, in my opinion. But drops in blood pressure, we have a new medicine right now, droxydopa, that can help some. So there are new things. You want to, did I miss a big category? This would take many hours to, yeah. to cover, but I think you got all the highlights. Okay, that's the initial list. Okay, there, and a lot of those that you have over there we've already touched on, but I didn't want to exclude something. You've been very patient, audience, and you've been very patient in your responses. So we're going to whip, those, whip through those and probably give another 10 minutes, and then I want to get you guys on, on the road before it gets dark, and, and this may not be a familiar area to you. If we've missed covering something that you want covered, all you need to do is send me an email. He's great about answering emails, so he'll answer, and I'll send him to the answer. So please feel free to do that. Go ahead. And feel free to leave if you must. Well, I, I have to address this. It's about sex. Okay. Could there be a correlation of PD and sexual activity because of aging? So the answer is sexual function absolutely can be affected with Parkinson's disease. In men, we know there can be a problem with the, uh, with uh, erections. In women, we know there can be a problem with arousal and lubrication. Uh, both of those things are common. And uh, both we know in men that it, res it can respond to medicines used for erectile dysfunction, including Viagra and those kinds of medicines. You have to be careful because there are potential side effects because it can drop blood pressure. That's the biggest issue. 
Uh, so this is absolutely an issue that uh, is being looked at. But again, other medicines may interfere, so it's important to uh, evaluate what other medicines are going on. It also, sexual activity can be affected in, in terms of positioning. And so that's something that you need to explore with your partner and you can talk about with your physician if they're able to do that, and hopefully they are able. But that's something that absolutely needs to be uh, looked at because different kinds of positions and uh, changes in that. Do we have any kids in the audience here? Okay. So, uh, you know, the, you have to make it uh, reasonable, comfortable, and if it's not comfortable, it's not going to work, right, for either a man or a woman. So uh, that's a very important issue. Do you have anything else to add about that sexual business? Okay. Uh, it, is, it is. How about depth perception? Wow, cool. So depth perception, visual depth perception. So there is a problem with convergence. People can have trouble shifting focus from far to near, and that can be affected by Parkinson's. And some people, that's helped by medicine. DOPA can be actually responsive. Others, it's not. And so shifting can be a problem. If the eyes don't work exactly together, then depth perception gets screwed up. That's more common in the non-Parkinsonian types of Parkinson's, so the other different kinds of Parkinson's. But in some people, it can occur and it can be actually DOPA responsive in some less common uh, cases. But if you have a problem with that perception, you should get checked by your eye doctor to make sure it's not something else, because that's really a bigger issue too. All right, how about panic attacks? Does panic attack meds work with Parkinson's? Yes, most of the time. All right, depends what panic attack medicine is, I guess I should say, because there's some that can be uh, more dangerous. So that would depend upon the individual specifics. We are close to, no, oh, I don't, I can't read this one, but I'm going to move on. Melatonin safe, we talked about that. The spit test called for 23andMe. The spit test is a way of getting your DNA. If you're going to 23andMe to find out if you have Parkinson's, go somewhere else. Oh, are we close to developing a cure for Parkinson's? We're a lot closer than we were five years ago but we're not there, okay? Because we're, what, do we, what does it need to really develop a cure? We need to know much better about the causes and exactly how those causes lead to the damage in the brain. And you have basic research. You don't build a skyscraper without starting with the basement, a good foundation. But we are making a heck of a lot of progress, so I think we're moving forward. The answer is just around the corner, but we're not sure how far away the corner is. Beautiful. Uh, why do my arms hurt? Your spouse is hitting you? No. <laughs> what, do I, what do I do about it? Uh, I take cortisone shots. Uh, that, there could be a zillion ways for arms to hurt, and it can be arthritic things related or unrelated to Parkinson's disease. Cortisone shots in some places, depend, you have to talk about that one with your doctor. It depends upon what they're treating. Someone has a comment, a question about turning off DBS and having that help with leg cramps. Wow. So, you know, that's not totally crazy, but uh, it is true that DBS, certain settings in some people can lead to dystonic cramps, so there's just cramps and posturing of different parts of the body. Is she okay? No, behind you, is she all right? Okay, just checking. I know I put some people to sleep, it's okay. <laughs> so, uh, in some cases, that can't, I mean, if, if DBS is doing it, turning off the DBS will make it go away. Uh, but if DBS is doing it and turning it off makes it go away, then there might be different settings that could give benefit without causing that. So that's one you need to talk about with the people who are doing your programming. So that's very important. So yes, it could be related. It doesn't have to be, but it could be related. Okay, is there any value to hydrotherapy, sitting in a water pool with... Uh, with hydrojets going over you, relaxing your body, making you relax. <laughs> I'm in. So the d only thing you have to watch for is when you're going into any kind of warm pool, standing up, your blood pressure can drop. And so you can be more likely to get uh, lightheaded and even faint. So just be cautious. We talked about exercise and progression. We talked about sense of smell, which can be an early symptom. Is there any consideration that PD is increasing uh, with the use of uh, lawn service chemicals? No. Uh, what about pesticides was kind of thrown in. So there is some research about uh, farm pesticides. They're not usually the ones used uh, 
Well, I shouldn't say that. You know, I used to, on my garden, my tomatoes, the most common pesticide that was said to be safe, you could eat the tomatoes the next day, was rotenone. We now use rotenone as an animal model of Parkinson's because it can go in and end up destroying the brain cells that cause, uh, that produce dopamine. So yeah, rotenone is probably not a good choice anymore. But uh, you know, so when I'm saying no, it means we have no evidence. It doesn't mean it doesn't absolutely have any relationship, right? Okay, any increase in St. Louis area due to the companies such as Monsanto? Really none, none that I know about. Could you give, do you know about St. Louis increased risk? How about Edmonton, any companies? We have the bigger chemical companies here. Uh, could you give any updates on research on PSP? I don't know. <laughs> I say the same thing. There is some PSP stuff people are doing. There's a big multi-center. Oh, that's MSA. There is a, there is a multi-center study trying to look at causes and manifestations of PSP. I think uh, there was actually one or two drug studies in PSP going on, yeah. Uh, what different types of Parkinson's? We referred to that already. And Parkinson's plus just means those other Parkinsonian syndromes like PSP or MSA or cortical basal degeneration or vascular Parkinson's. All right. What research? What research is going at WashU for PSP? We're not doing any research for PSP at WashU. I can tell you that right now. We're doing a lot of research on Parkinson's disease. We're doing a lot of research on Alzheimer's disease. Alzheimer's disease affects the same, there's the same proteins involved, so that may be a spillover, but there's no direct study right now on PSP, although we've been talking about one lately, actually doing a tauopathy scan. Uh, it's a man, just all a matter of money. And uh, so this is mostly about PSP. So one of the things we were looking at for PSP is there's a new kind of scan that may be able to measure in the brain the abnormal protein that occurs in PSP. And that's the study that we've been thinking about studying, but we haven't raised the funds to do that at this point. What can you tell us about stem cell research for Parkinson's? Are we getting close to using that? Uh, so stem cell research uh, was a big issue, it was more popular in the past. There's still a lot of research going on. And at first it had required fetal cells. And now apparently we can make from skin biopsy, we can produce uh, cells that can produce dopamine and we can inject them into animals and have dopamine produced. So that is a big advance. The big issue right now is it's a drug delivery system as far as I'm concerned. It doesn't get at the cause of the disease. And so right now you can mostly take tablets. However, the advantage is you can put the drug only where you want to put it as opposed to hitting other parts of the brain which may cause side effects. So there is a lot of potential. The biggest issue is dosing. There's no really, this needs to be worked at. There could be strategies to make this work, but we haven't perfected good ways of getting dosing with this kind of thing. And so that's really the biggest, to me, the next big unmet need in that. The other downside if, with stem cells, I think, is it, it might be a good drug delivery system for dopamine, but there are more neurotransmitters involved in Parkinson's than just dopamine. So it's, at this point, it doesn't look like a way of addressing multiple other problems in Parkinson's. And the biggest problem is thinking problem that doesn't do anything for that. Okay, what medicines do I recommend? I can't really give you drug recommendations on, on this kind of thing without reviewing everything in your study. Would you please address foot drop? That's when your foot, instead of doing this, does this. And the reason it does this, it, foot drop really is when there's weakness. And that can be from a variety of reasons. It's not really Parkinson's. The thing that's Parkinson's that looks like foot drop is the, there can be twisting of the foot where the foot twists down rather than just weakness down. And that can be a medication effect or it can occur just as part of, the, can be the first manifestation of Parkinson's as well. So that is something, and there are a lot of different ways of addressing, trying to treat that. Adjustment of medicine, even in some people we inject botulinum if it's really not able to adjust the medicine without doing that. What do you think of the pumps for continuous carbidopa levodopa? That's the dopa gel. And we talked about that. What about the peptide that is being developed that is shown to slow the progress of PD, the peptide? 
but peptide slows the progress of PD. Somebody's going to have to educate us. I don't know which peptide. It may be one of the things I already talked about. Can PD be mistaken with nerve inflammation? Uh, not by Dr. Martin. Would PD symptoms be reduced after? However, if somebody has Parkinson's and has uh, a neuropathy or an inflammatory neuropathy, it can make your apparent symptoms worse, but it's two different things. What PD symptoms would be reduced after sleeping at Ooh, neat. Oh, this one we haven't discussed. So waking up in the morning, I find about 20 to 30% of people have something we call AM benefit. In other words, they just wake up even before they take medicine. They may be much, much better. There was one guy I took care of in England who would get up and he could run and jump in the ocean and swim or the, whatever that water is there uh, and swim for, he had about 45 minutes and boom. And we think that's because during the night while sleeping and not doing activity, dopamine builds up in the brain and then does that. So, and that can help all the symptoms of Parkinson's in some people. Some people are absolutely worst when they first wake up because they haven't taken medicine all night. That's more common. But some people get this AM benefit and that's really kind of cool. Okay, does the new cancer drug, we talked about that. Lack of energy, we talked about. How important is it to have a neurologist? I already told you, it saves your life. Oh. Un, boy, that's pretty direct, isn't it? Uh, understand you are working on a drug to arrest Parkinson's. Can you tell us where you are in the process? I'm right here. <laughs> yes, that's the one that I want to, I've mentioned. We're, I, the next step for me is to develop a means of measuring its action in the brain. And when I can do that, then we're ready to go to human studies. We've done toxic, toxicity studies. It seems to be well tolerated. It has a big effect in animals. But remember, these animals didn't have Parkinson's disease. They had a different model, so we don't know if it's going to work. And it remains to be determined. But we think some of the mechanisms are shared, and so it may be of benefit. Would you discuss the benefits of alpha lipoid acid, lipoic acid? I don't know of any specific benefits uh, that have been proven with Parkinson's disease on this. Farm community. Our town of 40,000 has 270 PD patients in one clinic, and probably as many in the main hospital. Seems like 1.5 million of PD is too low of a number. Uh, that's interesting. Yeah. So that would be. Uh, worth investigation, because that's unusual. And I don't know how come you have it there. What is the neurological, when does the neurological become psychological in combating the symptoms of PD? Yeah, all the time. Or I would say the opposite. When does the psychological become the neurological? And let me tell you, I think stress has a huge effect on Parkinson's, has a huge effect on every disorder I know about. And exactly what's the connection, we don't know, but there's no question that that's a big factor. And uh, that's true for every disease. And I think everybody should just give up stress, forget stress. You, know? <laughs> you don't need it, it's not necessary. What do you think of deep brain stimulation surgery and what do you think about, so we talked about that, and then we talked about the gel. And the hand tremor is provoked by something. When I sit at my desk, at the desktop computer, what does the gases, what gases does the computer emit? Uh, it's probably more to do with your positioning and what you're doing at the computer than any gases from your computer. You're, I don't think your computer's emitting any gases that would cause it because I sit in front of my computer probably more than you do. Of course, I'm starting to shake. <laughs> Is it beneficial to pry to PRN dosage? Oh, is beneficial to take oh to take carbidopa levodopa as needed rather than on a rigid fixed regimen? Not usually. That can really screw you up. In some cases, a PRN extra dose can be useful, and there can be ways for doing that. But generally, just going from tablet to tablet as you feel like you're wearing off will give you much more difficult to control your symptoms than a regular regimen. But, you know, and, and the extreme of that is giving the dopa gel, which is constant infusion, which controls it even better. So that's why that strategy probably won't be the best.
Please talk about exercise. I think I did. Pet test. Yes. Oh, your favorite? No, pet. PDE 10A. Ooh. Who's into that? How do they know about PDE 10A? So we have a, uh, so PDE 10A is very interesting. You know about PDE 10A? I'll talk about PDE 10A. So PDE 10A <coughs> is a enzyme that uh, has to do with how dopamine receives signal. So when dopamine crosses, goes from one nerve to another, it hits a dopamine receptor. And for that dopamine receptor to work, it actually goes through a, a system that's controlled by PDE10A, whether it's D1 or D2, different kinds. And so that's a way of controlling the effect of dopamine. And uh, we really, at this point, don't know about its role. There was a first paper just published about PDE10A uh, showing some abnormality in it, but I think it's really too early, but it may be an interesting player down the road. It's looked at now in people with schizophrenia who have dopaminergic problems of a different sort seeing if they can uh, hit that as a drug target. So it may turn out to be an interesting drug target, too. So that remains to be seen. And here, we've developed a great marker for PDE10A that can be measured with PET. And there are several others that have been uh, developed around the world, but ours is better, well, we think. We're actually in the process of comparing them right now. All right. But that's a very interesting. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for coming. Really? <laughs> yes. Actually, Dr. Okay. Well, that's correct. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Problem. Uh, hearing songs and poems repeatedly, and nobody singing them is saying it. That could be an issue that you should discuss with your caregiver and your doctor, because that could be a medicine effect, or it may be unrelated, but it should be sorted out. Have you heard if boxing helps control the tremors? Not hitting people in the head, but doing that kind of exercise might be way cool. Uh, NPR released, oh, that's the crazy study. Uh, do you have any other information on the rock study? We talked about it. A poster on the side of a bus at the Galleria advertised you can get paid to take care of a relative. Do you know which government program? Yeah, there's a, you can take something off on your taxes. Just give us a call at the office. We can send you some information on it. Which insurance company has long-term long -term yeah, care we'll policy? Yeah, we'll find too. So if you have insurance questions, we have Stacy Barton who can help us out with some of those questions. Feel free to call. And how do you get an appointment with you sooner than July 2016? <laughs> it's now September, I hear. Uh, they got squeezed in. It's a problem. It's really a problem. And so we just hired a new Parkinson specialist. who will be starting July 1. He's actually really good. Dr. Pietro Mazzoni. Oh, I don't know if that's been announced publicly. So don't tell anybody, that's a secret. He's really good. He's really good. From New York. They are now, oh well, he's been in New York. He's probably from Italy. Okay, uh, they are finding that negative thoughts result in body creating less than optimal. Well look, negative thoughts are bad. And you know what, and I mean that sincerely. Attitude is everything. Attitude and stress is a big deal and whatever you can do and whatever you need to do to get that is going to be very important and I suspect it does have dramatic effects in the brain. Well I want to thank you, I want to thank Dr. Martin, I want to thank the audience for being so attentive and staying. As always I think we really really appreciate <laughs> And I want to repeat, if you have any questions that were not addressed here, really just shoot me an email. We'll, we'll let Dr. Perlmutter respond and we can get you back an answer for sure.